gira.
still come for only the moon. So I, I would like to read uh, the words that she has prepared for, uh, for you. And uh, this is uh, a speech. Uh, it is a real pleasure for me to welcome you to the Flagera Joint Transnational Call Information Day. We are in the Centro Cultural La Corrala, the Autonomous University of Madrid. So before starting this event, let me give you a few words. You see, this is a very interesting building about this, uh, this place. We are in the rebuilt Corrala, which is a type of dwelling typical of the old Madrid. These dwellings have sh uh, gave shelter to the numerous humble families that arrived to Madrid in search of work in neighborhoods close to all manufacturing uh, areas. People lived in this Corrala until the 90s. The 90s. But as an example of modernity and innovation, the Autonomous University of Madrid transformed this building in an open space to receive activities of science and culture. As you know, in 2013, the two European research flagship initiatives, Graphene, Graphene and the Human Brain Project, started its 10-year journey with the support of the European Commission and Member States. These two large projects were launched to become the first European research flagships initiatives with an expected budget of 1,000 million uh, euros per flagship. Four, year late, four years later, the flagships initiative uh, have evolved significantly, leading to new demands for the European society and its research community. This requires additional expertise and resources Plagera partially answers to this demand. The Eranet Flagera also started its journey in 2013. This Eranet gathered most regional and national funding organization aiming to support the ramp up phase of the flagship initiatives by specific calls to fund the new partnering projects of the flagships. I would like to highlight the high level of the research proposal submitted to the, to the last call, where 109 proposals were submitted, unfortunately only 19 projects could be funded. The success of this call is not only the 19 running projects, it is also the fact that these projects have become partnering projects of the flagships. This shows the high demand and interest of the European research community in the flagships and vice versa. In addition, Flagera went beyond a single call and it managed additional activities to support the flagships and facilitate the dialogue between national funding organizations, the flagships, and the European Commission, organizing workshops, analysis of the scientific landscape at national level in the thematic areas of the flagships, and the development of the partnering project mechanism. Tomorrow, um, I think tomorrow there is Specific, uh, specific portion for the kickoff for the for a new project uh, uh, funded by the European Commission on this partnering project. Flagera 2 will continue supporting the flagships. Uh, and today we meet in this information and networking day of the new Eranet Cofan Flagera 2. This information and networking day bring together researchers interested in the Flagera joint transnational topics as well as representatives of the funding organizations participating in the goal and representatives from the two flagships. The joint transnational call 2017 focuses will focus on selected research areas in the domains of the graphene flagship and on the human brain project. In addition, this event enables researchers to network and exchange ideas in view of building consortia for these proposals. The Flagera coordinator, Dr. Jofra, uh, will explain all that in more detail. I would like also to highlight the good Spanish participation in the flagships and the, the flag era uh, joint, uh, joint uh, call, reflecting the excellence of our country in this field. Let me underline that the Ministry and the Spanish State Agency for Research has been supporting the Spanish participants in both flagships and Flagera calls. In this regard, I must also emphasize that our support, support has been maintained and increased during these very difficult times. As an example, Mineco 
has increased its commitment more than 10% for the present year. Finally, let me recognize your dedication and congratulate you for your success in your research work. And let me encourage you to participate in this uh, in the next poll and wish you good work, good luck, and fruitly, uh, fruit, fruitful um, meeting. Thank you all for attending this today. You are very, very welcome to the Uh, answer uh, some 
questions already. Then there will be a poster networking session uh, in the room uh, next door uh, with the lunch, uh, including that part. And then uh, we will uh, come back here for a final, what we call it, call it a, a round table, but that means all the presenters could be able to answer any additional questions uh, that would uh, come up uh, during the, the discussions uh, in the middle of the day. And then we will uh, conclude. Uh, so maybe we can take a bit of time to get to know each other uh, because one of the goals of the day is uh, network. So uh, according to the registrations um, and roughly counting, we are a bit less, but um, really we are more closer to 80. Uh, so some people who have registered are not there, but. Um, so uh, on the basis of the registrations, uh, there are about 80 persons, uh, 60, uh, about 60 researchers, uh, with uh, almost equal sharing between graphy and the UK. Uh, and so let me let, let us check. So uh, who consider themselves in that first category, researcher? Raise your hands. Okay. So now, who among you are interested in graphene? Okay, who among you are interested in HPP? All right, so that's a, a smaller number. Uh, and then uh, we have, as I said, for the students, uh, a majority from Spain, and uh, a few other from other countries, and at least in the countries here. So just to also do the same thing, who is from Spain? And so who is from other countries among the researchers? Well, among the researchers, then we go through. So maybe for those who are, there are not very many, finally. So maybe for those who are from other countries, you want to just introduce that yourself and that for the networking activity. So, uh, yes? Good morning, my name is Jesus Rabanis. I'm coming from Greece, Athens. Uh, I'm, I am working in the uh, National Assembly for Scientific Research in Monsters. Our group, group is dealing with graphene functionalization, uh, application for bio properties, and we are interested in coordination <coughs> with, uh, for PMI shielding applications. Thank you. So, Hello. SP Technical Research Institute of Sweden, and we do material characterization, we do life cycle assessment, we do ecotoxicity uh, research. It says firefighting on the, um, the list of participants. Um, <laughs> I guess that was a mistake. We also do fire research, though. So <laughs> anyhow, we are here basically to provide our services to anyone who might want to partner up with us. Graphene is a messy, messy type of work. And we'll be glad to help you characterize the mess and clean it up. Uh, good afternoon for everyone. I am from <coughs> Institute of uh, Material Science of Kaunas University of Technology. That's in Lithuania. We, we have uh, experience in, we, in synthesis of the graphene and uh, 2D material uh, polymeric carbon nitride. And we have a lot of the relative experience, such as uh, plasmonics, uh, biosensors, 
uh, some research in the field of the solar cells, uh, as well as a lot of the uh, deposition techniques and characterization techniques. Thank you. It's a bit uh, surprising because uh, people coming from abroad, uh, generally if they have registered, uh, meant they had prepared. So maybe we have some issue with people having difficulties in finding the place or, uh, the sorry? The flu, the flu well, <laughs> a few more, but uh, so we have to, to check what's, uh, what's happening there. Um, yeah, and about the list, um, yeah, the the last column was actually uh, more, uh, maybe we should not have printed that. That was a way to recover uh, which, which uh, flagship you were most uh, likely to be interested in. Um, so, um, because um, as part of the networking uh, goal, uh, we would like to propose to put that list without that last column. Uh, just the, the name and affiliation and country uh, on the web page of the call if, you're, uh, if you think it's useful for uh, networking after uh, we can do that um, so well, I, um, I will ask later on uh, if everybody agrees on that um, so then there are seven flagship representatives. Actually, two of them uh, are also in the uh, researcher category, uh, and uh, five others are more in the administration of the flagships. So, uh, Mar, you can maybe introduce yourself too. Thank you. My name is uh, Mar Garcia Hernandez. I, uh, I am the World Package uh, Leader of uh, Material Science uh, in, the, in the Graphene Flagship. And uh, my background is in uh, experimental condensed matter physics. I am also a member of the executive board in the flagship, Graphene. And uh, I will introduce you in what are the main objectives of, uh, of, the, of the flagship. That's it. I see Javier de Felipe for uh, HBP. Oops, that's dangerous. Hi, and this is Javier de Felipe from the Cajal Institute, and I will introduce the Human Brain Project. I am one of the uh, sub-project leaders of this uh, project. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I can, yeah. Presentation I after that. So maybe uh, very quickly, so Kathleen. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always fun to join the Flagera event. I'm Kathleen Elzig, um, and I'm with the, uh, the uh, coordination office of the Human Brain Project. Thanks. I'll be tweeting, so um, any, if anybody wants to like them or retweet, um, yeah, pleasure. Thanks. All right. So that's the HBP <laughs> representatives team. Uh, Graphene, you had uh, Mar, and uh, you have also Anna and Anna Maria. Hello, I'm Anna Hellman and I am a work package leader for European Alignment and International Collaboration in the Graphene Flagship. Thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Anna Maria Chubotaru. Uh, I'm the deputy work package uh, with Anna Hellman and uh, we are working on the same work package, uh, European Alignment. Hi everyone, so we're part of the comms team for the Graphene flagship. I'm the press coordinator and communications officer. My name is Sean Fogden. We work in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, my name is Sophia Lloyd and I'm the science writer for the Graphene flagship. So I take any science news and um, interesting stories and we get them out to uh, the interested public and um, other people that may want to work with us in the future. Thank you. So <laughs> I guess I didn't miss anyone for the flagship representatives. Uh, and by the way, uh, among the researchers uh, present, uh, who is a member of a flagship already? No one. You are all, or uh, even a member of a, f of a partnering project. No. Yeah. One. All right. So maybe then, since there are only one, you can m mention which one or where? Well, it's, I'm not sure if it's how it fits. 
I'm a part of the Polygraph Project, which is an associate member of the flagship. That works? OK, good. <laughs> We're developing uh, in situ measure, uh, methods of making industrial quantities of graphene. Uh, so polygraph is obviously something funded by the commission. All right. Okay. Um, and so that means you are almost all uh, not in the flagships, uh, but maybe s um, so. Some of you have heard of the flagship to some extent. Well, we we we'll see anyway. The, the you will have the full presentation, um, but. Um, so, the y y we have a limited number of, uh, so, well, you, you probably, some of you don't know the flagship so, so well except the principles, so it will be useful to have the, the pr full presentation of the two flagships. Uh, and then we have the uh, funding organizations representatives, so uh, I've spoken for uh, myself uh, on in France, uh, the coordinator, and we have Fabien Guyot, who is there uh, standing, uh, who is working uh, with me uh, for the coordination of Flagera, the whole ERANET. Uh, we have, of course, uh, several uh, members of the MINECO, of the Spanish uh, Ministry of um, Economy and Competitiveness. Well, and sorry, now, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the acronym didn't change, but <laughs> okay, and industry. Uh, so, of course, Estrella, uh, Watse, Castelline, that you have seen already, and who else? There are a few others. Uh, Severino, Falcon, Morales were there, and maybe uh, are there any other representative? So maybe you can just sh say your name. Juan, all right, m so more on HBP side, is that? Okay, so nice meeting you. That will <laughs> be a good opportunity. Uh, and uh, is Carles can, uh, coming? No. All right. Uh, and then a few other from uh, other countries. So uh, for Belgium, there is Florence Quist over there. Uh, Netherlands, Rob Diemel. Ah, and <laughs> uh, Rob Diemel over there. Uh, I realize I for some reason, are you in the in the list? Yeah, so there is no registration somehow. So Sheila uh, uh, Meja is also from uh, French uh, ANR, ANR, and uh, for the HBP part. Um, then we have from Romania. Ah, okay, Dominica is there. Dominica Kotets from Romania. Uh, from Sweden, we have. Camilla Grunditz and Maria Oman. And from Slovakia, we have Susanna Panisova uh, over there. All right. And I hope I didn't miss anyone. All right. So now uh, you know who we are. We know who we are. Um, and we also have uh, more on the webcast. Do we have a mean to know how many people are connected? on the webcast? On the internet, all right. So we'll check and, uh, and see that. All right. So um, uh, as I just said, we propose to publish the list uh, uh, on, the, on the website. We will remove the last column. If everyone wants to not appear in the list, uh, just come to us and let us know. Uh, we'll, we'll anyway send an email with the list for you to check before we actually put it on the, on the web. Uh, another important tool for networking will be the partner search tool. It's, it's not yet available. It will be available in a few days, I think. Florence, do you have any uh, timeline for the... A few days. Okay, all right. So it should be... Uh, available soon, uh, so you will be able to uh, put information or on your um, organization and, and um, expert domain of expertise or the type of project you would like to uh, propose, so that uh, you can network with uh, the uh, others um, 
other researchers uh, interested in participating in the call. All right, so you have the agenda. Um, so that was the main part for the, the, uh, pr the introduction. Uh, actually, since Jean-Marie Auger, our project officer, who was supposed to um, introduce the flagship program, is not there, uh, I have a few slides on um, what, what are flagships in general before we uh, go into the details of each flagship. So just to double check, who has a good idea of what is a flagship? Who has no idea at all and except that, well, you all know it's a big program, you probably all know the, the average budget, but uh, who, who doesn't know more than that, than the ba very basic? All right, a few uh, hesitating hands. So some, somewhere in between. So uh, I hope what we will say, uh, what I will say will not be uh, obvious things for you. Uh, so what is a Fed flagship? That was a new model which was proposed uh, in 2009, I think, uh, at the level of the commission uh, for a new type of large-scale initiatives. There are already many uh, large-scale initiatives uh, for building what we often call the European Research Area, ERA. Uh, but either they are loosely connected projects or they are industry and application driven. And this one was more uh, science driven. So it's a large-scale uh, research initiative to address a ground scientific and, tele and technological challenge. Uh, by trying to gather a uh, large amount of efforts um, funded both by the Commission and the Member States, by the Commission through uh, mainly a core project, which serves as the aggregating uh, force um, around which uh, uh, other projects funded through other sources aggregate. And uh, there is a the, the glue of all this is a unifying vision um, born by the, the, the core project, uh, which uh, serves as uh, attracting and, uh, and connecting um, the, the, the all the efforts, uh, in addition to more, uh, and let's say, and contractual or administrative um, association mechanisms, which will be presented in more detail by each flagship. So the first two flagship initiatives were selected in 2013. Uh, the two we are we know already, the Graphene Flagship and Human Brain Project. Uh, there are there will be maybe more in the future. Uh, so just to give examples of uh, uh, flagship-like uh, initiatives, which gave the inspiration. Uh, um, when designing the flagship program. Uh, the most cited one was the man on the moon uh, uh, image or metaphor uh, uh, of having much efforts directed toward one single clear goal. Uh, but you have many others like the human genome project, uh, decode the genome. Uh, simple motto, very complex actually thing. Uh, CERN, uh, Large Hadron Collider, uh, the, the DARPA Grand Challenge, uh, uh, or Deep Blue, or the fifth generation computer in Japan. So all those are uh, large program addressing one big technical, scientific, or te technological uh, challenge with, uh, 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 of course, a strong impact uh, on, on society. And the first two flagships are the one you know. Uh, there are others. Uh, I, there are other ideas around. There were when the two f were selected. There were actually six pilots, uh, and some of them are still uh, considering uh, uh, competing uh, for new flagships. So there might be new flagships in the future. There are discussion around that uh, idea. Uh, obviously, it would not be in Horizon 2020 uh, because of the big budget. They have to be in the next framework program, but they should be, if they exist, they should be launched in the 
framework of Horizon 2020. Uh, and some key areas has been identified and, and there are uh, start to be discussions uh, to launch preparatory actions uh, again, uh, the whole process. So once again, the model of the flagship, uh, the flagship model is a long t for long-term, large-scale initiatives at the reopen level based on a unifying vision, a core project serving this vision and mechanisms to align the efforts funded by various sources with this core project and toward this uh, unifying vision. And this is what is called the partnering project uh, mechanism. Uh, and, and this is uh, what the, the, the project selected in the Flagera calls uh, are expected to, to become. Uh, the nice one nice thing about this model is allows a, a large scale integration of efforts while keeping flexibility uh, because uh, a partnering project can uh, can be um, selected through uh, it, it can be small projects selected through the usual uh, mechanisms and, and align and then they can plug in and come and go so it's it, it allows uh, flexibility and having large program like this offer new possibilities um, uh, that the two fl existing flagship uh, take advantage of so uh, well one way uh, uh, I like to represent things is that uh, um, because you should be aware of the distinction between uh, the partnering project concept and the associated member concept so uh, uh, the core project uh, obviously is a, a project with a consortium called that we can call core members and so partnering project uh, create a second tier of efforts of activities of research which can be performed by new members which are called associated members or by existing members the core members so uh, the partnering project can be, and for example, in the Flagera call that we are presenting today, uh, anyone can apply independently on of whether they are already a flagship core project or not. Um, all right, so this is just the uh, explanation of that. So uh, that was for the short presentation. Uh, is there any question at this stage? Uh, if not, I will uh, hand over uh, to Mar uh, for the presentation of the Graphene flagship project. Regarding the, the partnerships with people outside the core project, um, which is what this call is about, that we're all here uh, getting information on, um, is this something which was uh, envisioned at the outset, including the number of calls to be opened up, or is this um, is this something which is ongoing, which is being decided as the project goes along? So uh, clearly, the concept was uh, there from the outset. The idea of uh, having uh, uh, a combined effort of the member states and the commission was there from the uh, outset. The details were not. Uh, and in so, for example, well, the number of calls, uh, uh, relatively early, they came the idea of having a call every two years. Um, and then the details of the association mechanisms were uh, not uh, foreseen from the outset. And that th there might be some room for improvement there. So I remember a number of years ago, after the flagship, I'm talking about the Human Brain Project in particular because that's the one I'm interested in. After it had begun, there was an initial call for to bring people in. I don't know if it was to bring them into the core project, um, it was a different type of call than this one, yeah. and the, the past one, which also was to bring in partnering, par like a, a partnership, so to speak. That type of initial call, the f the is, is that, is that going to 
come up again or not? No. Okay. Uh, no, the answer is simple. It's no. And the, re the one very simple reason is that this was a mechanism for uh, FP7 projects, and in Horizon 2020, they uh, don't do it anyway. Uh, but uh, what they do uh, is that um, actually even the core project is not one single project, it's actually a sequence of projects every two years. So they have to apply every two years, and somehow they the, the, the consortium could evolve, can evolve every two years, and they can issue, uh, uh, not really, uh, the term is maybe not open call, it's more expression of interests. Uh, and, and so that's to integrate people directly, or teams or researchers, directly in the core project. But I, I, I mean, that those are questions for each individual flagship, and maybe that you might have questions, you should wait for that. And then uh, th you have the flagera calls, which are organized by the member states, not by the core project, and which explains the difference. So the flagera calls are uh, almost typical ERANET calls, and they are funded by the f funding organization, that by the national funding organization. So if you're, for example, you're from Spain. So if you uh, are successful in this call, your funding will not come from the commission, it will come from Mineco. 100% of funding for your team would come from Mineco, and uh, since you would be partnering with at least one other uh, team in another country, uh, well, we'll come back to the details of the LGBT rule, but uh, people in the other countries will be funded by their national funding organizations which is different from being in the core project where you get your funding from the commission. And the whole name of the game of a flagship, uh, in addition to have one large, already large core project which allows many things, is also to have a seamless integration of the efforts independently of whether they are funded from any source. The funding, national funding organization for this call, but it could even be other sources. Uh, it can be a national call. Uh, for example, you can also um, submit a call, uh, submit a proposal to Mineco, or for those uh, in your national countries, you can submit a, co uh, a project to your national call for something which take advantage of the synergies with the core project and then get associated through the classical association mechanisms of the flagship. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, may I ask you, and uh, who will evaluate the projects? Reviewers of the flagship or reviewers of the separate countries participating in, in the proposal? Now we start to enter the, the, the details, I will present that. So the short answer is an interna independent international panel designated by the funding organizations. But uh, So maybe we should uh, move on to the presentation of the, the two flagships and you will have maybe uh, additional questions after that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, I am Mar Garcia Hernandez and I uh, work in material science within the flagship. Well, uh, do we have... Um, no. Okay. Never mind. So, the first thing is, uh, what's the mission of the Graphene flagship? The Graphene flagship has a basic uh, mission, which is bringing the Graphene technologies, which are really disrupted, to the European from the European laboratories to the, to the Europeans, the European society, in a space of time of 10 years. That's, uh, that has a history that we will go briefly along that. And uh, it's the fact that if you remember, in 2004, graphene, what's the first to really two-dimensional material, was discovered by Manchester people, Gaiman and Novoselov, and they won the Nobel Prize in 2010. 
So it meant that the academic level of, uh, of, 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 of the European community in this particular topic was extremely high. We were the first ones to, to, to hit this uh, bidimensional materials and the, the level was really outstanding. So the first idea was, well, how we can really spread the news in an efficient way with you in Europe and how we can make this uh, discovery profitable for, for the Europeans, bringing jobs, etc. So, uh, you know, the, 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 that, that was the, the very basic uh, root of the flagship regarding the, the, the European scenario. So we tried to do that in 10 years' time, and for that purpose, we have a plan. This plan is our roadmap. Uh, as you can see here, we have here the timeline right here. That's the, 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 the starting time of the flagship, and it will end up in 2023. So the point, the plan is that we have to set first a platform of two-dimensional materials to be used in very many applications because they are amenable of applications in along, along the time to bring different products and, 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 and into new markets, so as to speak. So I want you to realize that uh, we are talking about graphene flagship, but we are really, it's, it's far beyond graphene because just graphene is the tip of the iceberg. That was the first bidimensional materials that was discovered but there are more than 6,000, in principle, feasible two-dimensional materials. And therefore, uh, we have to set a, a complete uh, database and a new platform based on these two-dimensional materials to be used in applications. So, uh, and then also we can make hybrids out of these two-dimensional materials in almost two-dimensional you know, uh, multi-layers and, and, and multi-components. So um, that was the idea. We, we started from the, a very academic point of view that, that's uh, reflect here in this, in this plot in the blue color. And as the time passes, there is a dominant color, which is the red one. The red one means the industrial involvement. Remember that the idea was bringing these discoveries that were merely academic to the markets. So as the time passes, you see that the weight of the academics goes down within our plan, while the weight of the industries and companies goes up. Basically, uh, I mean, talking about graphene in particular, as you know, graphene has very many good properties that can be used in very many applications. So, so far, we have not focused in a single application. So if you go through the roadmap, which is, uh, by the way, published in nanoscale last year, um, you would realize that uh, we start first with the big problem of large production of this material. So you, we have to generate enough knowledge to be able to, to work with these two ma 2D materials in, in, in an industrial environment. Um, not only with graphene, but as I mentioned, with other two-dimensional materials. The idea is that then taking these materials to components. These components really uh, encompasses very many applications like uh, transistors, spin balls, flexible displays, uh, uh, radio frequency tags, ultralight batteries, solar cells, ultrafast lasers, etc. just because we have a very good material in our hands. Okay, and finally is the integration of these components in systems. And these systems will go to the market. It is expected that uh, you know, this roadmap can have really a serious impact in ICTs, technologies that will be faster, cheaper, and flexible, and also in the energy storage and conversion that can be made more efficient, cost-effective, renewable, and sustainable, and also in health uh, sensors and uh, processes, etc. So that's um, our plan in, 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 in the 10 years LAM uh, time. Last. I don't know. Okay. So, uh, as Edward has been explaining to you before, um, these big projects last 10 years and have a, a funding in theory of 1 million. Now I think it's a bit less. Half of this, this funding comes from the European Commission. It's not really 500 million, well, what we have available now, it's a bit shorter. And there is a co-fund from the national agencies and regional uh, agencies. 
the coordinator of this particular flagship is Chalmers. And uh, the project does not interfere, interfere with, uh, with um, other national projects or European projects, but it is aligned, as later Anna will explain. So this is, for instance, the case of the Flagera. We do not interfere. The call is completely independent. Really, nothing has to do in the process of evaluation with previous people within the flagship. It's just another ERANET call, OK? Uh, it's clear that as it is aligned, the topics that have been selected for this particular Flagera call uh, has uh, something to do with the roadmap of the flagship, which is obvious. I mean, if we are heading towards a particular point, uh, okay, we need to, to focus our efforts in that direction. So it has to be consistent with our plan, with our roadmap. Okay, so um, that's what it is important to, 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 to go probably through the roadmap of, of the flagship. So, uh, as uh, Edward has also mentioned, uh, that's the basic scheme of how things work within the flagship and the partnering projects. Uh, the framework partnership is uh, basically this one. We have, along the time, in the 10 years time, Along this line, we have three different projects, apart from the rampart period that it's already over, over. It lasted for two and a half years. Now we are in core one projects. We are with 152 groups, partners, institutions, uh, and this project will end in by, by 18. Core project two, with, uh, we will decrease probably the number of partners, and core three, which uh, will remain around 120 partners. It doesn't mean that the 120 partners here are the same as the 120 partners that we could have here. But we will incorporate new people. And we will incorporate new people, not by open calls, that was the case there previously during the rampart period, but through expressions of interest. You know, just because uh, as the time passes, it seems that the technology and our abilities will be increased, and then we will need, finally, people able to take these discoveries to the market. So probably we will really hire quite a number of people coming from companies and industries to do that job, which is not an academic job, okay? That's important. And uh, it will be done with a particular focus. I mean, we need a particular kind of company to, to develop a particular kind of product, and it will be done through uh, uh, expression of interest. As I mentioned before, we do not interfere with the national projects, the regional projects, or, or the European projects, but we try to align through the roadmap, okay, and incorporating the new partners as associated members within the flagship, and then we have in, within this alignment this call, which is Flagera. Um, well, to see how the, the consortium, the, the initial consortium evolves, we have here the, 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 the timeline of, of the flagship. We have started in uh, the 1st of October in 2013. The rampart period, now it's over, it lasted for two and a half years. We had an open call, and uh, starting with this consortium, which was uh, 61 academics, 17 uh, uh, other, other partners like uh, mixed centers, etc., and 14 industrial partners, we incorporated in the open call 66 groups. The uh, evaluation was uh, made by the European uh, Science Foundation, had nothing to do with the flagship people, and we incorporated those that uh, the panels decided that were the best. Okay? So now, uh, it, it almost doubled the, 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 the initial consortium. Then we had the first Flagera call. We incorporated another 30 groups within this call, and we are here today. We have already started the first core project that lasts for two years. We are about to, to be in the middle, which will be by April, and uh, the Flagera call, the second one, the one that we are talking about today, you know, it's about this time, one year, I mean, in, in few months, will be, will be solved, okay? So, that's the, 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 the idea. We are increasing and we are continuously changing the uh, consortium. So that's the present situation in core one, uh, which, obviously, which obviously runs within the horizon 2020. 
we have uh, 152 partners uh, coming from uh, 23 countries. That's the spatial distribution of, of those nodes. Uh, we have uh, 15 science and technological work packages with uh, five administrative and supporting uh, work packages, like the one with alignment uh, that uh, Anna is representing here today. And we have uh, about uh, 450 full-time people working for the flagship and involving, most of the people are not really full-time, more than 100 and 300 individuals, okay? We have also 53 associated members and uh, many of, uh, of them are really involved and come into the flagship from the pandering projects. It means those projects that were granted in the previous flag area call, okay? Well, mm, the, one of the message really that are important for you to, to take home is the fact that the flagship flag is evolving towards a more applied point and therefore we need to incorporate basically companies. That's one of the reasons why we have uh, within this call two different sets of topics. The first one is quite academic and the second one it's really higher TRL just to fulfill this purpose. Okay? Uh, as you can see here the evolution of the flagship as I mentioned before is that uh, we have started in 2013 with 16 industrial partners. By 2014 we increase that to 41 and uh, in right now there are 52 industrial partners within the flagship. So really it's the, the share that has increased most along the time. The global effort in terms of uh, person months is that uh, the, during the ramp up is when I mean, it's already finished and we, we have really the, the real figures there, is the uh, 6,980 person months devoted to the, to the uh, development of these technologies within the graphene flagship. Well, what we have done with those resources, what we have done is uh, here we have uh, the key performance indicators. Uh, well, the first two and a half years were very academic, so therefore there are typical KPIs for scientific uh, notes, you know, is the number of, uh, of papers, the, the number of citations, also because we are interested in, in, right from the beginning on the industrial side of the project, we also look at the, the patents, prototypes, etc. And well, that was the target after two and a half uh, years, and our achievement has really outperformed all the, the, the intentions, the a priori intentions. So uh, you have that the number of scientific publications have been almost 800. Uh, citations, even in the two years time, is uh, 400 and 500. Uh, invited talks, 450. Number of invasion disclosures, 45. Number of patent applications, 49. Here we have failed, but we have failed because the procedures to release a patent within a two and a half years period, it's, it's, it's too short. So we have to wait for more time. So, you know, all the patent applications and disclosures can become really patents indeed. So uh, the number of prototypes, it was intended for, and there has been 36. Number of spin-off established, two. Number of products into the market, 13, etc. So, I mean, we are doing really well from that viewpoint. And we hope that uh, the figures uh, in, the, in the core one project will be also fulfilled and probably overcome. Well, uh, how we do organize our work in the, in the, in the, war, in, in the flagship graphene? Well, we have four different divisions. There are 15 uh, technical work packages that are represented here. That's uh, fundamental, enabling fundamental research. You must remember that even if we are very interested in taking products into the market in a reasonable period of time, uh, both projects, both flagships are, uh, flagships are uh, science driven projects. So you will always have academics around to solve particular problems. So that's the fundamental people, spintronics, materials, health and environment, biomedical applications, sensors, then here we have the pool of all kinds of electronics, fast electronics, flexible electronics, optoelectronics, etc. And then we have also energy, 
energy generation and ener energy storage. And then we have a set of uh, nanocomposites, which is uh, one basically focused on coatings and the other one in bulky uh, composites. Then we have productions. Here we try to incorporate complete um, value chains. For instance, uh, one of the uh, big projects that goes across the flagship is uh, building up uh, the, the a wing made out of a composite that contains graphene in cooperation with Airbus and put it that in the, into the market through Airbus. And then we have another uh, three uh, supporting, um, uh, five supporting uh, work packages regarding with administrative uh, task. So, as I mentioned, this, uh, this work package is organized themselves in uh, different divisions. The first division it has to do with the administration of service division. These are the, the contacts for each work package. Uh, then we have uh, this that it is organized topically, the, those divisions, and also in terms of the TRL that they are set in. So uh, this is a very fundamental people with enabling, uh, enabling technologies, enabling materials, and spintronics. Then we have uh, the topic of health and environment, basically. So we have health, medicine, and sensor division. Uh, here you have the contacts. Uh, electronics and photonics integration division with electric device, optoelectronics, flexible electronics, and wafer scale system integration. Large scale technologies division that encompasses all the work on uh, nanocomposites and uh, also in uh, energy storage and generation. And then the partnering division, you will automatically relate if you uh, uh, are in charge of one of those uh, projects, with, uh, you will link with this partnering division. You can find all the contacts and all the distribution in, this, uh, in, the, in the web page of the, of the flagship graphene there. That, uh, And uh, well, what's the future evolution? I have been already talking about that. We have to continue moving towards higher technology readiness levels, but keeping the fundamental science component as well, as I mentioned before. It's a science-driven uh, project. We have to focus the activities. There has been a too lo large spread of topics within the flaxic graphene. And now we have to really start making the choice uh, on our focus from the industrial point of view. We have uh, to look at what is doable and what is worth doing. We have to make an analysis of the markets. I mean, there might be some uh, particular applications that are very good and are interested, but maybe you know the, the, the Chinese are already in charge of that particular application, and then you cannot compete. So you know you have to, to find the balance on what's doable and what's worth doing. And uh, we will make this decision not in an obscure way, but uh, in a completely clear and transparent way, which uh, we will have four inputs. One are the easy the reviewers. I mean, we will take into, into account the performance in the previous ramp up period to make decisions about core one. We will take into consideration the output in core one to make decisions on core two, etc. We will have internal review. We have already. We are already. In that process, there, what you do is that you go with a plan for the next two years in your particular work package, and there is an external panel that says to you, well, you know, that's the right track or no. You have to redirect your, uh, your uh, choice. Um, also, everything that is done has to be consistent with the uh, technology and innovation roadmap. And uh, also, uh, we rely on the opinion of the Science and Technological Forum that, uh, you know, it's uh, just the collection of all work package leaders and work package deputies, plus the Strategic Advisory Committee that in our case is conferred by uh, four Nobel Prizes and uh, also um, chairs of uh, big companies like Airbus and, uh, 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 I don't know, BSF, etc. So uh, that's all on my side. So thanks very much for your attention, and I am open to questions.
Thanks very much. From from your presentation, I had the impression that so you, you have described how the amount of uh, members has increased mm. with time, and there were two steps. That means there have been two calls to to get in, or because I remember one. No, the there was the, the not an initial call. Uh, I mean, there was a pilot action. Mm -hmm. There was the nuclear of the first consortium conformed by these sixty-one uh, academics and. Uh, some other people, okay? Then we have the open call. And the open call was the one that was managed by the science, uh, uh, the, the, the European Science Foundation, okay? Uh, that was uh, 2014, that's right, okay? And then we incorporated 66 new uh, institutions into the flagship. And then we had the Flagera, <laughs> with these partnering uh, projects that are funded by this era mechanisms very similar to the one that we are attending today, okay? So that there has been three steps. The initial one that came as a choice of the pilot action, then the open that was feasible in FP7, but it's no longer feasible in Horizon 2020, and it will be substituted, as I mentioned, by the expressions of interest, and then the first flagera, and now the second flagera, okay? That means that participating in the flag era and getting a project means automatically that uh, the, the group in question uh, becomes a member. No, becomes, an becomes not a full member because you are not entitled to get another funding from the, f from the flagship, okay? But you are an associated member. It means that you have all the rights, but the money and the confidential information won't be made available to you. But the rest of the activity, it will be a uh, you are incorporated automatically, almost automatically. That's another channel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw in your presentation that uh, total budget of the uh, uh, flagship, uh, graphene flagship is about one billion of the euros. And uh, total budget of the present call is somewhere about 10 millions of the euros. So could you please uh, comment this difference? Well, first I mentioned that uh, initially it was intended 1 billion euro. Half of that used to come, I mean, should come from the European Commission. We have already had cuts on that uh, because, well, really there has been a strong crisis and, you know, Juncker is taking money from there to some, somewhere else. So that's it. Then the, the other half billion comes from the national agencies and co-funding, from your institutions, regional agencies, etc. Okay, that's one point. So really we are not now in those figures. Now, the situation is that Flagera is funded by your national agencies. So it happens <laughs> that it follows different rules for different countries. I don't know which is the amount that Spain, for instance, is, 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 is putting into, into the pot, but uh, you know, it's a choice of the Spanish government to, 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 to say whether it's one million, 10 billion, or whatever it is. That's one thing. Another question is that because of that, the rules to participate in uh, Flagera are different from country to country. For instance, in some countries, um, small and medium uh, companies can enter in and being, fu being funded by, 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 the, by the call, but it doesn't happen in other countries. So, you know, that's a personal, or no, I mean, it's a statal um, choice, the, the, the amount of money that they have in this Flagera call. It has nothing to do with the European Commission. So, half of this, uh, of this money should be divided later by the European Commission director, by uh, 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 No. No, 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 no. You have an external panel, you have an independent call, and you know the European Commission has nothing to say about that. It's just you, you, the, the, the national agencies that they make their choice and the, 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 you know, the uh, uh, prioritization of, of, of the topics and the prioritization of all the ways in which you can apply within this, this, uh, this call. Less 
Yeah, okay. that, sure. So, sure. May, yeah, sure. May absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can uh, reply to that. That relates to the question we had before. Uh, was all this uh, decided from the outset or not? And so, to be clear, uh, the the plan, the initial, very initial plan from the Commission uh, at the very beginning was this magic number, 1 billion euro. Uh, and then they said, okay, uh, half of this should come from the member state and we'll put the other half. And so in practice, they say, okay, let's launch the, the, the half that we have control on and let's invite the member states uh, to to join for the other half. And then the member states were observers at that time. Uh, and uh, the question is, so is not about the only the transnational calls. Today we are speaking of a transnational call which is dedicated to the flagship. So this will 100%, if there is no bug, uh, it will be 100% going to something which is really associated to the flagships. But there are plenty of research. I'm sure that some of the research you already have in your project could be associated to the flagship if you find synergies. So you can also discuss with the flagship representative today about associating to the flagship even outside this call today. And uh, the fact is that when we prepared the flagships, not only for those two topics, actually for all six topics which were considered before selecting the two, we did some analysis of um, what is the estimate of funding going in research which could be associated uh, or which could contribute to the uh, flagship uh, goals. And the estimate was that the amount of funding flowing through the national funding organization altogether is the same of the order of magnitude as the one which is put by the commission. So if you add up all the existing projects which are not yet associated or not associated but could be associated to the flagship, then you get into those figures. Does it clarify? All right, so this is the simple answer is this is virtual money and if there is no association, it will remain virtual. If it's associated, it will become more integrated. And this is not up to us. This is up to you and the core project to make things clear. <laughs> All right. Other questions? Okay. If not, next speaker. Hello, good morning. So I am uh, Silana Hellman, and I am actually stepping in from for Professor Max Leme, who was supposed to be here and unfortunately got sick yesterday. So he um, he apologizes, and he also asked me, "Can you hear me? Okay, yeah." Um, he actually asked me if I could could present uh, some more information about this partnering division and the partnering mechanism and how this works and what what are the uh, the plans for the future so basically uh, most of this information is published on the web on the graphing flagship website uh, under the section which is called partnering mechanisms and here I just briefly recall some definitions that we try to give to for example what is a partnering project so partnering project is a is a research innovation activity whose objectives are related to the to the uh, roadmap of the flagship and partnering projects really contribute to the to achieving the goals that are set in the roadmap and they they uh, bring additional expertise complementary expertise or or new uh, new areas of of uh, of research into into the the flagship umbrella and the idea is really to use this partnering project as an additional as an opportunity to, to foster collaborations between the core project and this other nationally funded or other European funded project as to, as to foster the alignment and to, to work more closely together towards achieving the, the goals that Mar has, has uh, mentioned. 
So the associated members, there is the, the distinction there. It's, it's an institution. So a, a partnering project is a project. It has to be a defined uh, fundi, funded activity with its consortium and, and associated funding. And associated members are basically the members that are involved in the partnering project, which are not core members, so that's why this, this, this terminology. But it's important to remember that associated members is an institution. So it cannot be a lab, it cannot be, uh, but it can be a university, for example. So why to get involved as a partner in projects? Indeed, there has been a lot of discussions about incentives and why should one be interested in this. Uh, as I said, the partnering project is already funded, so to make it clear, there will be no additional funding uh, for a project just because it becomes a partnering project. Uh, however, maybe uh, later we will hear about the new scope project, which does actually offer some uh, support for, for partnering projects also in, in financially, but I, I guess this will, we'll talk about this later. Um, so the, the idea here is that the benefits are mostly in terms of access to the networking platforms, access to the community of the, graf of the flagship, and also trying to build together this community. Exchange of information, exchange of, of, of uh, data and material. Of course, here we have to respect all legal boundaries that are set by the, by the core project and by the partnering projects in their respective uh, consortium uh, agreements and other legal documents. Uh, other incentives are that partnering projects really do get the visibility uh, as, as part of the Graphene flagship, and my colleagues from dissemination maybe can also say more about that when, when we have the discussions later on. And uh, the partnering project, the idea is to also involve these uh, uh, projects and its members in identifying future opportunities for, uh, for collaboration, future needs. Uh, in terms of research and, and therefore engage them also in, in developing the roadmap. This has already been the case for the current edition of the roadmap where uh, some associated members have actually participated in the workshops that were uh, done to, to develop the roadmap. Uh, the full list of benefits are, are listed on the web page and, and uh, you can go and t take a look there as well. So I would not go into the details here about the flagship structure. It's, it's a kind of can look complicated, uh, it's, but uh, basically the main, the main body is the General Assembly, uh, which represents all members of the core project. And then we have the executive board, of which Mar is part of, the director, the management panel, which is an operational uh, body, which is under the, the executive board, and then the five uh, science and technology uh, divisions. And then here, this, the fifth one is the, the one I will uh, talk about a bit more in, in detail. So the partnering division, Division 5, has actually been established uh, now in the core one. B before, we didn't have it. Uh, and it's composed of partnering projects and associated members. And uh, it's still a loose concept, I have to say. So there is, there is this division. We have the people. They haven't met all together uh, yet, uh, the first meeting of the partnering division will happen in, in April this year, where we will discuss with, with, with the people involved on how to actually make this work, what would be the best structure and, and what, what kind of needs are there for, for the partnering projects and associated members. Of course, um, it's not a thematic division, so it goes across all other science and technology divisions, so you have projects on spintronics, on materials, on health. So it's it's they are not they don't have one one common scientific uh, uh, topic, but it cuts across all 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 topics. So this this may be a bit a challenge. Uh, and uh, an important point is that partnering projects are represented in the governance of the Graphene flagship, and through this division, through, through this fifth division, and in particular through its division leader, Professor Leme, who was supposed to be here, and the deputy. And this is very important because uh, um, the division head of the partnering division is, has a seat and actually participates in all decision-making bodies of the flagship. So this means the executive board, 
but also the management panel, which is more on the operational uh, side, but uh, the, the, the there is his, the, the input of the head of the uh, partnering division there. And it also participates in the science and technology forum where planning for core two uh, is, for example, discussed. So this, this is a big meeting where all the uh, work package leaders and deputies get together and discuss what to do in the next project. So it's, this is an important aspect. Now, in terms of examples of partnering projects, uh, Edouard has already mention, mentioned this. It's, it's an open concept. So obviously, uh, Flagera-funded projects are obvious candidates, I would say, to become partnering projects because the topics uh, are exactly aligned with, with the flagship needs. And uh, this brings in, of course, uh, member states' funding into the flagship. And, and uh, this is, uh, let's say, the, the easy situation. Then what we would like to have is, or to see more in the future, is other existing national projects, uh, projects that are funded by national agencies or governments that are, have interest to join the flagship. So there is a possibility for, for that. Uh, and then also uh, easy funded projects. There, are, there is a number of... Uh, a fund, a funded projects which are on graphene and related materials through, through other uh, EC programs, the, the ERC, uh, NMP, so this is a materials program and, and so on. So these are of course also welcome and we have some of the, them already. Uh, then as again as Mar mentioned, the, the aim is to move progressively towards uh, more applied and, and innovation uh, activities. So we, we would really welcome more p partnering projects which are, let's say, on the higher me or medium to higher end of, of the TRL as to, to accompany the, the tra this transition. And of course, transnational programs like Flagera are really helpful because uh, instead of having to talk to 35 or so funding agencies separately and try to convince them to somehow align their priorities, th there is the Flagera network who, who does part of, of, of this job and, and this is really helpful to, 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 to advance. Now, uh, where do we stand now? Uh, currently, uh, so this is constantly evolving. So I think Bar showed maybe a slide that was from uh, months or, or so ago, but we, 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 we are constantly approving new partnering projects and new associated members. So currently we have 18 of them and 13 are Flagera projects from the last call. So basically all projects uh, that were funded by Flagera were uh, associated as partnering projects with no exception. We have two uh, quite large projects from the NMP call, and I'm happy to have someone here from po Polygraph, right? So this is one of the, these two NMP projects. Uh, two ERC grants. So you see very these are basic uh, research projects, but of, of interest to the, to the flagship. And one national project recently from Serbia. So in total, this gives us 62 associated members, so 62 institutions that are uh, associated to the flagship. 44 are part of uh, either one of these partnering projects, and 18 are uh, so-called, what we call individual nominated AMs. So this is a, an, another option actually for institutions to be associated with the flagship, and this is mostly used uh, by companies. So out of the 18, I think almost like 80 or 19 percent are, are companies. Uh, because this allows us to, to bring closer to the flagship some, some uh, potential end users of graphene uh, technologies or, or some companies that are just interested to, to see what is happening uh, on, the, on, the, on the, let's say, more down the, 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 in the roadmap. Uh, and it's important uh, also this, this individual associated members. In terms of country coverage, uh, you can see it here. So we have associated members from, I would say, most European countries. Of course, larger countries have a big, big proportion. Um, and is, if you, s you can see here that actually the share of companies is even larger, if I'm not mistaken, than in the, in the core consortium. So we really kind of are managing to achieve the, the objective to, 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 to bring uh, these companies also under, under the flagship umbrella. Many of these are actually SMEs. Uh, oh, that's a mistake, probably. Yes, sorry, <laughs> it's, it's a mistake. <laughs> it's, yeah. 
maybe there is some space in the Excel file which should be there. Anyway, uh, I would not like to talk too much here about the associated association process because this is kind of quite uh, bureaucratic and I don't think of, of interest to you, but uh, we there has been, as Edward um, re referred to, quite a lot of work to actually set this up and to define how we are going to associate uh, institutions to the and projects to the flagship. Uh, what are the conditions, what are the processes, who does what, who can nominate projects, who selects them, who approves them, and so on. So um, uh, this has been developed basically during the ramp-up phase. So we have worked on this together with the funding agencies and the commission during the ramp-up phase and so that we are, were ready at the beginning of core one in April last year to start implementing this process. As Edouard said, it may not be perfect, it, may, it can be still improved. For the Flagera project, so the, the projects that are funded through Flagera, this is a little bit simplified, so there is a simplified process for, for Flagera projects to be associated. Again, if, if there are questions, we can talk more about that. It's, it's, I, I see it more as a, as a technicality, but of course, if you're interested in, in details, we can, we can discuss. And then just to, to conclude uh, here, basically the, the idea that partnering projects and the core projects should work together uh, and uh, we are trying to provide, to facilitate these interactions uh, and the, the, the scope project will, will further help uh, that so that basically we, uh, we move progressively to towards higher uh, TRLs and this is this concept of innovation partnering projects which, we, which is still to kind of be defined. These are for, for like kind of a spin-off uh, type of activities um, but the idea here is really to, uh, to, defi to, to help the integration in a progressive way and hopefully without adding too much bureaucracy. Now there is some bureaucracy associated to it and basically what the partnering projects are requested to do once that they have been approved is to sign a memorandum of understanding with the core project representative and this is a non-legally binding document because for the time being this is the only, the only way we could find uh, to, to do that, which basically uh, describes the, 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 the terms of the collaboration, describes what the partnering project is bringing into the flagship and what the core is, is offering to the partnering project. And, and it's, a, it's a short document which, uh, which basically describes the, the, the collaboration. Again, non-legally binding. Uh, one open issue that we still have and we are working on currently is how to deal with con confidentiality and IPR issues between the core project and the associated members. It's really non-trivial. Uh, what we do know is that uh, the respective contracts, consortium agreements have to be respected. The core project has its own consortium agreement. Uh, which places some requirements on how this NDA, how the, uh, how, uh, what kind of, uh, let's say, um, obligations there are uh, for, from the point of view of core project partners. So um, we are try, trying to, to, to think now how, how to solve this. And uh, the idea is that we provide some guidelines in, in the case partners, associated members, for example, would, would need an NDA in order to carry out the, their work with, with or collaborate with the core project. Uh, the message I can give here, yes, we have some guidelines, but it's not a ready to use template. We cannot provide you with a piece of paper that you can just sign and say, okay, we have dealt with IPR issues. It's quite complicated. Uh, so this is ongoing work and I hope we will be able to, to um, somehow address it uh, soon. Final message is how to stay informed. And again, I, I stole a little bit of content from my dissemination colleagues here. Uh, there is a newsletter, a public one, which everybody can sign to. Um, there, are, there is a list of events organized by the flagship, both the open ones and, uh, well, I think on the web it's mostly the open ones. Anyway, so you can take a look there, it's updated regularly, and then you have the contacts here of, of different, uh, different contacts for different issues. And yes, I would, I would encourage you to, to take a look on, on these pages and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Okay, thanks. Questions, of course. Yes, that's fine. 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. I'm Jose Navas. I work here in Madrid with uh, environmental issues related with graphene-related graphene materials. Um, what happens uh, if you, I, I mean, we are working on in a, yes, our situation in a big project, a large project from the Horizon 2020, and part of the project is working with uh, graphene-related materials. I suppose the project can become a uh, PP, but then all the uh, partners of the projects become associated members, only part of them? How, how does it work? Yes. So uh, for in this case, there is a, a, um, actually the members of the consortium are free to choose whether they want to become associated or not. Uh, because we don't oblige people to, 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 to become associated members. We have a, s a similar situation for one of the a NMP projects. If it's a big consortium and if only part of the project is relevant to the flagship, then the logical thing to do was, would be to, to, to say, uh, to, to, to ask only the, 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 the institutions that are really involved in the graphene work to become associated. And this is in the, we, so we have some application forms uh, which are available on the web. And each institution can tick a box and say, yes, I wish to be associate, or no, no, I don't wish to be, to be associate. My question is, is it very demanding? I mean, are there many applications to become a partner? And then a lot of rejections, what's the rate? Uh, sorry, the, the rejection what? rate? No. Yeah, the rejection ah, rate. It's very low, I would say. So the threshold to become a partner in project is, is not high I, from my perspective, but it, there is a form which is relatively simple that needs to be filled in by, by the coordinator. And the questions that we ask there is, well, a short description about the project, the motivation, why would you like to become a uh, partnering project, and then how, how you envisage the collaboration and the exchange of information. Uh, so it's a three-page form, more or less, not too demanding, hopefully. And, and uh, these are processed as they arrive, so there is no deadline. Uh, whenever we have an application, we, we process it. It's, the decisions are made about this association by the management panel, which meets every month. So typically within a month, or I would say two months, the, 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 this can be, can be solved. What we do suggest is before submitting an application, it's a good, uh, we, we, we advise to discuss with the project leader of the, or work package leader of the flagship, just not just to submit an application and see what happens, but to try to have an initial discussion, see what interest, to fine tune the, the application, to see, okay, this may be of interest to the, to the core project, this not, what, what, what do we put forward, and, and so on. So it's, it's completely <coughs> acceptable, and I would say we, we encourage to do that, to have a discussion. Just to mention that I think that the, the, the rejection rate is very low because it goes through the previous uh, knowledge probably of one of the work package leaders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, people, I mean, there is an interaction and you say, well, it doesn't make sense or it doesn't make any sense. So I think that if they really, the, the number of applications will, will not filter by that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, reje the reaction rate would be much higher, definitely. I mean, it's not just a matter that anyone that wants to become an associate member they will do it automatically. No, it has to have a purpose, and it has to be well described, and it has to be substantiated. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, may I continue uh, this question? And uh, what uh, what are requirements for uh, uh, proposed project and for proposer to become member? So, what are uh, weak uh, weak points which may result in rejection of the proposal? Possible weak points. Yes. Well, I think. The, so there is a set of criteria that we list on our web page. There, there are some, um, let's say, more um, 
technical eligibility, like there, it has to be an existing, if, it's, if we talk about a partner project, it has to be a funded project with its duration uh, corresponding to, 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 it cannot be a past project, this would, this yes. would I mean, it has to be an active project. Uh, and it has to be relevant to the Graphene flagship objectives and the roadmap. Uh, and the best people who can judge on that are, of course, the researchers, and, 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 and this is why we really recommend the discussion with work package leaders to assess whether the research you, 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 you are doing is, is really in line, with whether it makes sense, as, as, as Marcel, to, to, to have it as associated. So it's, it's not, let's say, hard criteria that I could tell you, but it's um, that, that definitely there has to be a relevance to the, to the overall objective of the flagship and, and the roadmap. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? So I think then we okay. go to the ne next item. Okay, I think no, I have it. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Javier de Felipe, one of the uh, scientists, uh, leader scientists of the Human Brain Project. We are 11. Uh, directors of the, well, of the Science and Infrastructure uh, Board. So I'm going to talk today mostly about why the human brain, port, uh, how, sorry, how the brain project is important for better understanding the brain. So one, uh, one of the major uh, goals in the, the 21st century is to try to understand the, the brain. This is one of the greatest challenges that we have. If we can gain uh, this, we, we will get uh, profound insights into what makes a human. So now, for example, we don't know what is special about our brain and why we are humans and compare with other mammals that have the same, uh, similar structures in, in the brain. Uh, to build revolutionary computing technologies and develop new treatments for brain disorders. So to understand the brain better, we need a large-scale interdisciplinary integrating infrastructure uh, for performing holistic multilevel studies of brain and body from analytics and neuroscientific data by way of synthetic modeling for partially partial full brain simulation brain model reconstructions and to design new uh, computer architectures and robots and this is uh, very important just to emphasize that this uh, European FED flagship project to create and operate collaborative research a tool for experimental and virtualized brain research and developing brain derived derived sorry technologies i will will explain you later uh, what is the from the scientific point of view why is so critical or why is so important to have this kind of interdisciplinary approach to better understanding the brain so uh, this the flagship uh, the story started in 1909 that uh, they was um, uh, the European ICT advisory group recommend that implemented a new funding uh, scheme to make Europe, uh, Europe a major player in big international uh, research project. And so in, in March of uh, 2011, six candidates were selected for a pilot phase and uh, for writing a full proposal and finally uh, we were selected in uh, 2013 to uh, flagships, the graphene uh, and the human brain project. So this is the uh, project timeline. We uh, start to prepare this project in uh, 2009. Uh, so now it's uh, eight years ago, my God, it's a long time that we spent to organize this uh, project. Now we are in the AG1 phase and this is uh, this is the, the, the project timeline. You can see these uh, pictures and these uh, slices in the website. Uh, this is uh, the HPP at a glance. These are 10 years. It's like a, a previous uh, talk about the graphene. It's 50%, it's 1 billion. Uh, it's 50 percent core project, 50 percent partnering. They are now in the core project. There are 400 scientists of, from 116 institutions and 19 countries. We are creating a six prototype infrastructure platforms released in March of the last year. And this has been embedded previous and existing national 
and international initiatives like the Blue Brain and the Cajal Blue Brain, uh, Brain Scale, Supercomputing and Modeling the Human Brain, Spinnaker, etc. So this is embedded in, within this uh, uh, project. So there are 23 industrial collaborations, 121 research collaborations with non HBP research groups, 61 with universities and institutes uh, or in third countries. So the, these are the three major branches within the human brain project. This accelerating uh, medicine contribute to understanding uh, and diagnosing and treating, and treating disease of the brain, accelerating neuroscience, integrating everything we know about the brain into computer models and simulation, and accelerating future computer learn and derive from the brain to build the supercomputers and robots uh, for tomorrow. So this is now uh, how is we are organized. There are uh, 12 uh, uh, um, sub-projects. Uh, there are uh, four are from neuroscience, uh, which is called from SP1 to SP4. The ICT platforms, there are six, and we will explain you later. This, this is the Central Services and Ethics and Society. And these are the called, uh, are called design projects, which are the integration of many different projects. So the flag era joins the uh, transnational call in, in 2015. There are six, uh, the, these are the fixed, uh, f first uh, partnering projects. Um, this is uh, from the SP1, that is my project. We have three of them, and I, I can say that this has been a, a fantastic theme because in, the, in this case, for example, Canon is a group of researchers that have been integrated now for the next phase of the Human Brain Project, bringing out new technologies that we were not uh, having before. So the, the flagship objectives from SG1, that is the period that we are now, is to create and operate an European scientific research infrastructure for brain research, for cognitive neuroscience, and for other brain-inspired science. Gather, uh, organize, and disseminate data describing the brain and its uh, diseases. Simulate the brain. Build multi-scale scaffold theory and models for the brain. Develop brain-inspired computing data analytics and robotics. And ensure HBP work in a, is, is understanding responsibility and benefits for the uh, society. So this is the platform, uh, is the idea is to have a collaborative research tools for brain research and brain inspired computing technologies uh, uh, to create prototype and, uh, hardware, software, database, uh, brain atlas and programming interfaces, uh, continuous refinement in close collaboration with end users uh, to have access through the HBP collaboratory. You can go to this website to have more information about this. So these are the platforms uh, to, to support the science, these uh, six, as I said before. One is the brain stimulation, simulation, sorry, that is the collaborative integration of neuroscience data and multi-scale scaffold models and simulation of brain regions. Neurobotics is testing brain models and simulation in dynamic virtual environments. Neuroinformatics is uh, organizing neuroscience data, mapping to brain addresses. Medical informatics, bringing together information on brain diseases, then uh, neuromorphic uh, computing, ICT that mimics the functioning of the brain, and high performance analytic and computing uh, hardware and software to support the other platforms. So this is the major structure of the, uh, of the human brain. And now we are now in, in close collaboration and, and we have a lot of meetings with for the brain initiative uh, is the so-called uh, more popular Obama project of the brain activity in the United States, also with the Catholic Foundation, the Allen Institute and other uh, big uh, institutions and projects just to try to have a, a global cooperation in the, in the, in the, the whole, the, in, the, in the world. So this is one of the, the things that we are trying to do now. So this is from the beginning. We had 270 publications, and some of them have been uh, one. One of them was published in Cell. And this is the cover picture, and there was a joint effort between the Blue Brain and the Human Brain Project. More than 85 people. We create the first uh, in silico uh, 
a, a model of a, a cortical circuit, and this is the, for, for the very first time, and this has been a joint effort between, as I said before, the blue brain and the human brain. So now I'm going to talk uh, from more uh, scientifically why is so important to have a project like the human brain. So um, the objective of the SP1 is the one that I am the leader, so I can explain you better uh, why this is, is important. So the idea is to generate neuroscientist concepts, knowledge, experimental data sets and tools, which uh, will be used to build models for the simulation and the brain, or the brain and uh, to pri provide data for knowledge and to support activities taken in other, in other SPs. So this is the, how would the SP1 have the interrelationship with other uh, SPs, like the SP6, SP7, we have input from this, the output is from these other sub-projects, and this contribute to the different uh, co-design projects. This is the general organization. But uh, I think the most, uh, from my point of view, I, I mean, the, I am uh, anatomist and uh, a neuroscientist, so the most important aspect is uh, because the brain is, is very, very complicated, as you know, is the most uh, the most complex structure that is, uh, is, is said in the universe. We have been now focused in three or four major uh, circuits: the neocortex, hippocampus, basal ganglia, and cerebellum. So, when we see a picture like this, then uh, the retina is stimulated, and then the flow of information is. Uh, traveling within the brain to the interior, this is the thalamus, and here uh, start a, a, a fantastic journey within the brain, that where the brain is like a neural forest in which the neurons represent like a trees. And this is a, a amazing how uh, these uh, neural circuits contribute to functional organization of the brain, giving rise to cognition and behavior. So when you see a circuit like this, this activity is generating is making us humans. So this is a mystery how the circuits, the connections, the activity uh, produce, give rise to these things, no? So one of the uh, first steps is to define the is detailed structural design and to map the con uh, its connection matrix. We need to know how the brain has been designed, what is the, the structure of the brain, and how the interaction between the different elements create this fantastic thing is like to be a human. This is a mystery, and as you know, uh, neuroscientists, we are uh, several thousand, uh, well, several hundred thousand people working on the brain. If we consider psychiatrists, neurologists, neuroscientists, basic neuroscientists, etc., they are, uh, we are a, a big uh, army. So we need to know the structure, how these uh, cities are, uh, uh, connected and why and how this connection gives rise to this thing. So, a major question in neuroscience is what one, uh, what can be done with the data and how can it be interpreted? Uh, Sidney uh, Bretner um, summarized this very well during his uh, presentation, the a Nobel lecture called Name a Nature Gives uh, uh, to a Science in 2002. He said, we are drawing in a sea of data and starving for knowledge. The biological science has exploded largely through our unprecedented power to accumulate descriptive facts. We need to turn the data in knowledge, and we need a framework to do it. So that is something that we are trying to do with the, with the human brain. We have the data, but we need to understand the data. So, uh, it seems that the most appropriate approach to make uh, the neuroatomical studies, I insist that I, uh, neuroatomists, I explain you why from my uh, re, m, m, people that I represent about the uh, structure of the brain, uh, what is important. So to make this uh, more significant, it's necessary to integrate this ana uh, anatomical information with genetic, molecular, physiological data. This integration uh, would allow the generation of models that present the data in a form that can be used to reason, make uh, predictions, and suggest new hypotheses to discover new aspects of the structural and functional organization of the brain in both health and disease. So, if, for example, we are trying to understand what is, which is the 
the implications to have these different uh, spines or processes in the, in the neurons. Uh, you can generate data, but you cannot understand if you don't have a model and you don't have a, a, a simulation. So that is very important to, to understand this. Uh, it's, it's interesting that people, uh, even colleagues, that they don't understand very well why it's important to have simulations and models to understand the brain. We need the models, and otherwise it would be impossible to, to advance in the, uh, to, uh, to better understand in the brain. So this is, uh, for obvious reasons, we cannot analyze many, uh, many aspects of the human brain because you, you cannot manipulate for ethical reasons, of course. So we are using the mouse also as a, a model to understand better the human brain because uh, in, in, with the mouse you can manipulate and then you can, we can try to extrapolate uh, to predict what is going to happen in the human brain is the only choice that we have uh, so far. And one thing that we are trying to do is th that uh, the technologies that we are developing to analyze the, the mouse brain, just to, to try to apply in the human brain if possible to better understand in our brain because one of the major problems that we have now in, in neuroscience is that uh, most data that we have about the human brain is based on the on the mouse brain, but our brain is not a big mouse, so we are we, we are human, <laughs> so we need to know what happened to us. No, so so for that reason, it's very important to to use data that can be extrapolated from the mouse to the human to try to understand better this. And this is an example of uh, why uh, I am very happy with the Human Brain Project because it gives me the opportunity to collaborate with people that otherwise would be impossible or very, very difficult because each, each laboratory has their own priorities, but because we are in the same framework and the same project, we are doing, we are collaborating to get, to, to add value to the thing that we are doing. So this is an example that we have just published in a, a prestigious journal, is, is eLife, uh, which participate, my group, just to, uh, to compare the giving provide microanatomical details about the pyramidal neurons, which represent about 80% of the, of the neurons in the brain. And these two groups from Amsterdam that are uh, analyzing the physiological aspect of these neurons, and the theoretical team from Jerusalem, Eden Segev, is the uh, theoretical team to integrate the anatomical and physiological data. Just to give you, uh, this is a case, for example, this is the, the pyramidal neurons in the mouse, this is the human. It's obvious there are larger neurons, but what is are the functional properties of these cells? So the thing that we are doing is to, uh, to use the mouse and the human to make uh, the tail comparisons, and we have discovered that the, the membranes of the, of the neurons, of the pyramidal neurons, have a different capacity, and, well, different properties, so now, uh, the, we are, the, we, the thing that we are doing is, based on mouse data, we are extrapolating and predicting what is happening in the pyramidal neurons in the human. So at the end, we can have a much better idea of how our neurons are working. So I insist that this, in this case, this, these are physiologists, mathematicians, and anatomists. But this is another a major issue, for example, now about the synapse. One of the major uh, goals in neuroscience is to reconstruct the brain at the ultrathustural level, just to see the synaptic contact. The synapses are the, the point of communication between neurons. And as, 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 uh, so far, in the last uh, few, uh, five years or so, it has been developed a new technologies that are called automatic electron microscopy, which is a dream that we have the anatomy for many years because you can go inside the brain at the ultrastructural level and you can identify each synaptic contact, that is the, 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 the major goal, is to understand the connections of the brain at the ultrastructural level, the synapse. So do, you can see now, this is a machine that is using a gallium to mine the surface of the structures, and then you have a scanner to, to, uh, to, uh, to take a pictures of the surface. And this is a piece of brain, as you can see here, something amazing, that this is automatic, uh, you can go inside, these are these little lines, uh, I, I, sorry, I cannot, you cannot see it because it's very small, represent synapse, synapse. So now we can have serial reconstructions at the electron microscope level made by, by a machine, 
now before or the vast majority of laboratories in the world are using uh, other type of uh, uh, technologies that are uh, using by hand. So it's, uh, it's impossible to get this kind of 3D reconstructions. So now we have this technology that uh, thanks to these uh, big projects, we have been able to, to use it for the study of the brain. This is not used in the brain. Before had been using, it was introduced in 2006, more or less, or a few years before, to analyze materials, but not the brain. So we are now applying this te technology to get uh, to advance in the con uh, connections of the brain. So, and now, uh, lastly, uh, this is another very important concept. Now, for example, I am an anatomist. I have a dream. I, I would like to know to have a machine that I can do 3D reconstruction at the ultrastructural level. And then I have these fantastic things. But now I have to know. And now I need to visualization of synapses, not enough. I need to label. I need to quantify. It. If I do by hand, they will take uh, forever. So I need uh, experts in imaging uh, analysis, image analysis, and uh, develop tools to, um, uh, to for segmentation of the synapse. So, and this is a tool that is called SPINA, that is from the Human Brain Project and, the, and from the Blue Brain. So we have, because that method, uh, this tool does not uh, exist before, we have to develop. And now you can see these are the synapse. So, uh, we have, this is the, uh, you can see the here now, in green are the in inhibitory synapse, oscillatory synapse, in, in, in uh, red, uh, the uh, 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 inhibitory ones. So this is, with these machines, we can uh, make reconstructions, obtain 3D data about the, the ultrastructure, the connectivity of the brain, and I insist that this is uh, something it will be impossible uh, to do it in a, a, a small project or a single project. So the advantage to have uh, this kind of uh, big projects and interdisciplinary is critical to go uh, faster uh, for the in development uh, for the study of the brain. And not only that, but also you can see here that each stack of images represent uh, several gigabytes. So uh, the computers that we have are not uh, enough powerful to analyze this material. So we need to develop uh, technologies also to, for imaging analysis. So for that reason, it is fantastic when you, we have these meetings that we are people, experts in mathematics, expert imaging, uh, um, uh, anatomists, physiologists, molecular biologists. So the idea is how to integrate uh, different expertise in a common objective to add value, just not to publish a nice paper. It's just to say uh, this together, this plus this plus this plus this is a big thing. And that is the idea of the, of the human brain. And I think that is what I, all the things that I, I, I was thinking to say today. If you want some question or something, uh, thank you very much. Good morning. So you haven't said anything about becoming a partner in the Human Brain Project. Is that because it follows the same directives as so the other project? The, yeah, the partner, the partner, uh, partner project, uh, we can change it. No? Okay. So this is independently. It has been selected independently, but now are integrated in the human brain. As I say, there is one, one of the uh, of the, uh, the flag era of this uh, is called Canon, one of these projects, and they were experts in, some, in a, uh, optogenetic and other methods to study the activity of the brain that in the core project were nobody uh, uh, expert on that. So now, in the next, uh, next step for the AG2, uh, I am in contact with them because one in very important thing is to integrate the in vivo studies, they, they are experts on that. In silico experiments, that is the blue brain, for example. Anatomy is like a, my laboratory. And then a computational a technologies to integrate everything. So the idea is to have, in a given circuit, to have in vivo, in silico, and everything together. 
and these are the flag era. This was a, so the idea of this thing is uh, once is uh, entering the patent project in the in the project, then we have we are discussing together how we can collaborate. And, in many, and one very important thing is that sometimes, as I say, the priorities of each lab uh, is quite different. You know? For example, I am, I am expert or my, or my interest is the neocortex. But in the, as I said before, there are four major uh, circuits that we are trying to analyze, the hippocampus, the cerebellum, basal ganglia. And uh, in the basal ganglia, if I tell you truth, I have no idea in the sense that they are not expertise, so I cannot help. However, because there are experts in, other, in this field, in other, other laboratories, they need data from the microanatomical point of view that we can supply from my, with my technology. For example, if they need to know the density of synapse in 3D, for example, we, can, we have the technologies. So then I, they talk, uh, we talk with them, and then we, we see how we can help and, and then we can get a much better approach to analyze the brain. So this is the idea, okay? So it's an interaction all the time with the rest of the people just to add value. So you have major interests in the particular laboratories and then collaborative with the rest of people and to try to put together, uh, for example, yesterday we have a video conference talking with people and uh, making the molecular uh, simulation. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So we will talk later in the, in the coffee break. <laughs> All right. um, so Kathleen proposed to continue answering the question. Maybe we can yes. take the yeah. uh, uh, by showing, showing where is this bit here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kathleen Elzig, and I, as mentioned earlier, I work with the Human Brain Project very closely with Javier and our scientific leadership. Uh, the division that I'm managing is partnerships and outreach. And I'll be happy to just show you on our website a little bit of information about how you can join the Human Brain Project as a partnering project. This is outside, of course, of this particular JTC call. But so outside of a JTC call, I think it was explained very well as well by the Graphene Project, um, you can join the flagships, the Human Brain Project, as a partnering project. Um, and it's pretty easy to do so. Thank you. So we pretty much have everything on our website, uh, as you see here, um, the front page of our website. Uh, to join, to, to learn how to join the HBP, you just go under Participate, and then Partnering Projects. And you'll find here uh, very much uh, the same information that you've already heard, actually, from Graphene. And it's, in some ways, uh, not a total surprise. We have uh, worked together um, and, and shared information on, on Partnering Projects. What you'll learn here um, is not only how we define partnering projects um, and associated members, but also what the eligibility criteria are. And again, I don't need to run through it necessarily again. Yes. Oh, my question. Okay, thanks. So I don't necessarily need to run through it all again, I think. Because you've heard it very much from our colleagues from uh, Graphene already. So, I mean, we have the same, uh, very much the same eligibility requirements and that is the partnering projects, um, bring your own funding. So this is really a bring your own lunch with you. Uh, and um, and that the, the, uh, the proposals that you submit need to be also approved, pre-approved by our, our scientific leadership board. But as Graphene explained, I mean, we have a very similar, simple process. It's not difficult. And you'll find all of the, um, all of the paperwork here. as a very simple proposal. And it goes through a, a few steps, so it will go from um, you know, from the proposal which you will submit, there's an email as well on, on this website, relations at humanbrainproject.eu. You'll submit your proposal to us. We'll have a quick look, get back to you to see if you have any questions, or we, if we have any questions about the content, and then we will send that uh, proposal to our scientific leadership, who will have a look at it to uh, see where the best fit is. Um, and these application procedures are described here um, in this part. To learn a little bit more about the, uh, the current partnering projects, because we do have six of them, you'll also find uh, a, very nice, um, a very nice overview of, of them here on the website. Although I don't see it here. Um, it is here on the website. Anyway, 
So here you see at the bottom also the application procedures described. Um, are there any basic questions about <coughs> joining? Otherwise, I do encourage you to, to have a look at the website. I'm here all day, so if you have any questions, would like to talk about it, of course, uh, I, I'm happy to answer any questions about how to apply, how to join more of these procedures, if you will. Javier is an excellent, of course, um, spokesperson for the project, and he can answer any scientific questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. So, no, it's not the thing I want to do. All right. Okay, so uh, we'll now present. Uh, well, a bit about Flagera, but uh, mainly about the call itself. So, uh, Flagera, to give the context, uh, a brief overview of the first call, so that you can have maybe a, a, a glimpse of what it looks like afterwards, uh, because the, this call is very similar to the previous one. Uh, and then uh, we'll dig into the, the, the current one um, so this, all the presentation will be put on the website uh, at the end. Uh, and by the way, uh, so we have published the full call announcement yesterday. Who has noticed that? Right. Who has not noticed that? Who doesn't know? All right. Um, so uh, I will present the, the, the core ideas, and for all the details, go and download the full call announcement. Um, if you are here, that means that you have probably read the pre-announcement. Who has read the pre-announcement? Who has not read the pre-announcement? Right. So um, there is. Uh, the, the full announcement only gives a few details uh, in addition, but there is no major change. Uh, <coughs> most of the information uh, was there already. Uh, there is one potential change of uh, addition of a funding organization, and I will come back to that later. Uh, but for the rest, it's almost unchanged. So. Well, what is a flagship? I mentioned that earlier this morning. This is just because the, the slides will be uh, online. So you have that again. I showed that earlier today. I didn't show that, but it's another representation of the same thing, but more in terms of uh, flow of funding. So the commission funds the, the core project, and this is not very convenient place to be and uh, we are here the national funding organization putting smaller amount of individual funding to many more projects uh, and when you have those figures of being balanced the idea are oh great thanks uh, uh, the idea is that this could sum up to about the same size and um, so Flagera is two things. Flagera is a network of organization uh, which uh, fund projects at the national level and it's also um, uh, organizing joint transnational call which are only a small part of that uh, funding. Uh, so as I said, Flagera is like any project, is both uh, an activity and a network of organizations uh, working together. Uh, we have two goals, two main goals. Uh, one is to uh, work with the flagship to set up the mechanisms to create this integrated uh, work uh <coughs> and the mechanisms to uh, use existing calls to fund research in the framework of the flagship and to launch dedicated call. I insist that on that because just focusing on the dedicated calls, the transnational calls, is only part of the story. So we are a, a large network of funding organization 
basically almost all, virtually all uh, countries in Europe are involved. We have two levels, the, the operational level of the funding organization and also more uh, strategic uh, uh, level of ministry or at this national policy making level. So coming back to the first call, everything is available online. Um, it, it was already a call for the two flagships. We had in between another call for the four pilots. Um, some of the main features is that uh, we wanted to make it clear as soon as the first call that those calls are for funding both core project members and new partners, which are expected to become associated to a flagship. You have some figures here. Uh, and the outcome of that first call was 19 selected projects out of 108 submissions. So the selection rate was uh, 18 on average, 18 percent on average, um, with no really significant difference. Well, the, the figures are small, so it's difficult to say that the difference would be significant between graphene and HPP. Uh, and actually the, the size of the call was smaller for HBP. It's al already also the case here because some uh, major countries don't participate in that uh, part of the call. Um, but the number of submission was highly, well, wha was directly, the different number of submission in the two topics were uh, directly related to the participation in terms of countries. That is, if you removed uh, the submission in graphene topic, which included countries which were not participating in HBP call, you would have numbers even lower than the number of submission for HBP. So it was really uh, not the, the, the attractiveness, but just the number, the, the, the set of countries, which was the, the explanation for the difference in submission uh, on the two, two topics. The total funding provided to the two flagships uh, was 13 million euros and once again it was unbalanced because of uh, the call being unbalanced at the beginning. We are about in the same situation this year. Uh, and in the end, um, 14 uh, out of the 14 countries, 12 could uh, fund actual projects. Hopefully this year there are more countries, uh, more funding, we have co-fund. Uh, which is helpful. We have some more support from the Commission, uh, which will uh, be helpful. So we hope to have uh, less difficulties in, uh, in getting... Uh, so uh, I will come back to that later, but uh, since we found projects at the national level, if one country has no more money left, then uh, this becomes an issue and it can be blocking in the ranking list. And uh, sometimes you are we are lucky, it works quite well. Sometimes we are less lucky with the ranking, that was the case there. Uh, but the more, the bigger the call, the less you, well, the more you can, uh, uh, you will f stick to the statistics basically and, and you don't run into problems. So let's hope for the best for this one. And um, we also had a few uh, countries which were not participating in the call who were represented by partners in projects. So it's possible if you have a partner uh, that you really want to work with and they can come with their own funding because they are not in a country in the call, uh, this is possible. And that was... Uh, uh, an illustration of the distribution between the funding which went to core members and to uh, non-core or new members. Uh, uh, for that call we introduced a rule to bias a little bit to new members. That was the beginning of the flagships. We don't have this rule anymore. So you can see that there is a little bit more on new uh, than on core. But uh, by removing this rule, we can expect that it's more even more balanced. So now for this call, the Joint Transnational Call 2017. Uh, 
So it's once again for the two flagships. Uh, the indicative budget is uh, 15 million euros. Um, actually, we had contact uh, just two days ago uh, by an additional funding organization, which is in uh, Flanders, uh, who would like to join. So uh, we just added uh, that possibility in the call announcement and they will have an official position on January 25. And so if they actually join, the budget will increase and uh, the situation in Belgium will be that not only the French speaking community will have access to funding, but the whole country, including Flanders, will have access to funding. Uh, for the rest, we don't expect uh, any further change. Uh, so the deadline is uh, mid-March, March 14. So uh, you can see the list and the map of countries. We have more countries than last time. Uh, uh, with uh, the about the same amount of initial indicative budget. But once again, thanks to the co-funding from the Commission, uh, we can hope that we will stick to that kind of figure so uh, we can hope to have uh, a call as at least as big as the f first one in the end so it's basically a call for transnational projects in synergy with the flagships those are the two main features of the call transnational projects in synergy with the flagship so the fact that it's a call for transnational projects and not national projects stems from the fact that we are organized on a, as an Aeronet. Uh, we use that funding instrument from the Commission called an Aeronet, which is done for funding organization to launch transnational calls. Uh, uh, in the case of the flagship, we could have gone for something else, but that's the way it is. We went for an Aeronet. Um, and so uh, we are calling for transnational projects. Uh, however, <coughs> sorry. Um, in the case of the flagship, since the project will be integrated in the flagship somehow, they will have transnational cooperation with 20 countries or so. I don't remember ex the exact figures now. It, it's 20. How, ma how many countries are there now? 24, 20, well, 23. And how many countries are in HBP now? Sorry? 19. All right. So you get a let's say a transnational cooperation with 23 or 19 countries uh, for free somehow. Uh, so we thought that uh, asking to first partnering with three countries to, to ensure the transnational cooperation maybe was a bit too, too much. And since the Aeronet uh, funding instrument uh, enables to have only uh, two funded uh, two countries funding in a, in a given project, we have found a compromise, which is uh, to say that the consortium which, must, which submits must have three countries represented, but if one of those three countries can get the money from the core project, that's fine. So in other words, either you do the conventional Aeronet way, that is you have three countries, you have three partners in three countries requesting money from three different funding organizations in three different countries. Or you do that only with two. You uh, request funding in two countries. And the third country is uh, a partner from the flagship core project, which uh, ensures, uh, which secures its own funding. Uh, is it clear for everyone? Because uh, this is a rule where we often have questions. So I it must be clear. <laughs> I mean, it, it states that uh, in the, the second case, at last two partners requesting funding from two different particular countries plus one core project partner securing its own funding. It means that the core project people cannot apply for more money. Is that right? No. So uh, if you are securing your own funding, so uh, to do the job? No. Uh, you can apply. 
you can apply and then you are in, a, in this option. is that, for instance, uh, CNRS, it's a very big uh, institution. So you have a particular um, principal inve investigators there that participate in the, in the, in the core project. Um, do they follow, I mean, if you are not a PI belonging to the uh, core project, but you belong to the CNRS, for instance, then you can apply it according to the rules that uh, of three partners requesting funding from di three different countries, or the same applies in the second case. You know what I mean? No. No, I mean that. I mean there are big uh, institutions with uh, some but principle. Maybe you are referring to the big number thing. That, that's right. I mean, in okay, so then I, I understood your question. That was a big question in the first call, uh, especially because you had this open call. Uh, well, the two flagship has this open call with this rule imposed by the commission. This is the past. You can forget about it. That was not an issue in our first call for a very simple reason, because we are not the commission. And so we don't have this rule. Uh, uh, we, d our, we are not expanding the same grant agreement we are creating new grant agreements. So we don't care about this uh, peak number thing. Uh, so in the end, what we did in the first call, uh, which even completely disappeared now, but that was in the first call, was that we had uh, a balance rule. We wanted enough PIs from outside the core project. And even that has disappeared, this one, in this call. Uh, it has disappeared because it was difficult to check because what is a PI in or out uh, is not completely clear. Um, so, uh, and for your question about why, why would I put myself in such a situation if I am, for example, as you said, a CNRS member, a CNRS researcher uh, already in the flagship, I would ask for funding. You're right, because Francis Aynar is participating. But if you are in UK, UK is not in the list. And so you're, so to take the concrete example, you are in Spain, you are a, a flagship member, and you would like to cooperate, let's say, with France and UK. And so, for, so uh, and you really need the UK team. A and it's already in the flagship. And your project doesn't necessarily need something else. So then you just go for this one. You ask to your colleague in UK, are you ready to come with what you already do in the flagship? Uh, and we will get money, uh, me in Spain and uh, the other guy in France. And we'll ask for funding there. And another advantage of asking funding in only two countries is that when we go on our side down the list, you have even less chance of being uh, blocking. So that can also increase your chances. Yes. Maybe you have said that, but I want to make sure that I have understood. It doesn't mean that you can have, in, in this case, two countries. That means one group from country A, one group from country two, and then uh, someone from the flagship of country two. No. It's written here. Always three countries in the consortium, and that stems from the fact that funding organizations are so accustomed to the fact that an ERANET goes with three countries. Even though it's not legally enforced by the Commission, the Commission legally enforces or contractually enforces uh, two, but in practice we always go for three. So, so that's custom and so this is what was the compromise so if it's a third partner coming with in its own funding from the uh, from the flagship it should be from another country uh, I agree it's a bit complicated but well in the end uh, that works it's a complicated it's, it's difficult to explain in simple words but in the end, 
it, it's not an issue. Uh, I, I totally understand the rule. That's very clear. My, my question is more regarding the added value of having someone from the core project on the proposal. So, and this raises the issue as well of who evaluates these proposals because... Okay, so let me finish the presentation then. Okay, sure. Um, uh, so, another rule is that the co consortium coordinator must be funded for obvious reasons because if we don't have a contract with the coordinator, you see the problem. Okay. Uh, another rule is the consortium must be balanced for also for obvious reasons. If one partner asks for 98% of the funding and the two other for one person each, this is not a really uh, transnational collaboration. So we have, this rules comes in two flavors depending on whether you are in this or this situation. Okay. Uh, so, and then the second big uh, idea in this call is to uh, call for proposals of projects in synergy with the flagships because that's the whole name of the game of uh, this uh, Aeronet and this call. Um, and so uh, we ask, what we do is we ask at submission time uh, to, to include in the submission uh, some information about the foreseen uh, collaboration, the foreseen interaction and the expected uh, synergies. And we basically reuse uh, the, the document that the flagship use anyway when they want to have a, pro a partnering project associated. So we just streamlined it a little bit because there were redundancies with the uh, core document but basically the information is the same as what they will require. So that means that if you are selected, in the end, you just cut and paste into cut and paste, uh, the information uh, into a, a, a more adequate form for this last step uh, and send it to the, flagships, to the flagship core project. Uh, and of course, and this needs to be clarified also because in the first call, a few people misunderstood that. They thought that might be a conflict of interest to speak to the flagship or something like this. No, we do encourage discussions because we want synergies. There is no, no problem about that. So of course, uh, then uh, that was the big issue for us when we designed the first call was uh, how to find the right balance uh, between the goal of selecting projects which would work as closely as possible with the flagship and the need for independence because we are responsible for national money uh, um, to get the best possible project without conflict of interest, without, uh, well, using our national rules which ensure uh, the, the, the excellence of the selected research without um, conflict of interest. So in the end, uh, basically what we do is we interact with the flagship before and after and not in between if we simplify the, the, the image. So what we do is we first discuss upfront so the topics of the call have been based on the flagship inputs. Uh, uh, there were uh, some selection especially in the case of uh, HBP um, uh, there was some selection from the uh, funding organizations. Um, this year, uh, in the case of Graphene, we just took it basically a as is with very minor uh, adjustments. Um, uh, and in the first call, so there were some adjustments. But uh, we basically take the, the input from the flagship. Um, maybe in the future we'll have more interactions, but. Um, the, the, the flagship has a strong say in the definition of the call topics. Uh, the second thing is that the submission includes information on how the project wants to uh, make the best of those potential synergies. Third, the scientific evaluation panel is independent. That is, no one from the flagship is in the panel. Of course, that doesn't mean they should be uh, blind about the flagship. On the contrary, we ask those people to understand 
what is the flagship concept and uh, what is in it and uh, are there are the syner expected synergy, real synergies, etc. So they should be informed, but not uh, part of the core project. And then the formal association takes place only after and only for selected projects, obviously. Well, obviously, I mean, that, that could have been another uh, process to ask everyone to get a formal green light before applying to us and we would be the second one to give the green light but that would have been too heavy uh, so we do it uh, that way around uh, and so this uh, uh, was sorry uh, this is what I just explained before so the list of <coughs> sorry the list of topics, you have that in the pre-announcement, in the announcement. Uh, nothing has changed between the two versions. Strictly the same. Um, as you have noticed, there is, in the case of graphene, there are two parts, two subcodes, one for basic research and one for applied research and innovation. Um, this comes from the fact that uh, we wanted to accompany the flagship toward uh, more application, more innovation, higher TRL levels. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to attract more innovation-oriented funding organizations. We are only halfway through this. May hopefully in the uh, next call, we hope to have a call every two years. So uh, it will go even further toward innovation. So uh, it's more mainly applied research and some innovation. So you can embed innovation in there easily, um, but it's not pure innovation in each uh, topic. There is quite much applied research there. And the LGBT rules are exactly the same uh, there. The only difference is the list of funding organizations. Some funding organizations are more interested in applied research, others are more interested in basic research. Uh, and so some participate in both and some participate in only one. So that means that uh, you have, if you want to go there, you might not have some countries that you would have on the other topics. Uh, HBP, uh, finally we had only one single sub-call with basic and applied research, um, the TRN levels up to now are not uh, high enough to make uh, a separate call involving uh, potential innovation. But that's the expectation is that in the future we also go in that direction. So this is the table uh, of funding um, that you have in the uh, call announcement. The one you had in the call pre-announcement had two differences. This column was not there. And this footnote was more partial. It was just saying uh, for Belgium, French-speaking um, uh, community only. And uh, as I just mentioned before, uh, we are under uh, we are discussing with FWO, which is the Flemish funding organization, uh, and uh, they are willing to join. Uh, but it's not official yet, they uh, took contact two days ago, and they expect to take their decision on January 25, which is not too far. So if some of you have good partners in Flanders, you can contact them, uh, it's worthwhile, and in about two weeks from now, uh, you will have the green light. If it fails, then... Uh, um, that, that, but still it's worth uh, discussing uh, with them if you have uh, good, good contacts there and hopefully it will be confirmed at that date. Uh, <coughs> the number of uh, fundable research group, this is obviously an estimation, uh, is a hint for you um, to know whether uh, there is a risk in partnering with uh, teams in that uh, country. So, for example, if you have high numbers here, 
Um, for large countries, that's okay. Uh, smaller numbers in smaller countries, that, that's okay. But um, you might have cases where uh, there is uh, limited budgets in some countries and that can put a risk uh, if we receive too many proposals involving um, uh, partners in those countries, yeah? And maybe just uh, before, before you ask the question, I m explain also uh, how it works. So um, uh, since we use our national funding, there is always this issue that after we get the ranking, we create a table. Uh, so we have the ranking, we have the countries, and we go down the table. And obviously, the uh, amount of available funding uh, doesn't reach at the same ranking depending on the country. Um, so, so this is a, an illustration of you have, for example, one project with partners in different countries, and, and so some funding organization would have partners in two projects, etc. But uh, so we go down the list, and when uh, there is not f no funding left. Um, we have a few options before just giving up. Uh, the first option is that the country might increase its budget. Uh, this is what often happens uh, if it's not too demanding and if the country has some flexibility. It uh, happens that uh, some, some of the countries in, in the call do have some flexibility in general, it cannot be a, a promise, but they try to adapt. And some other countries um, uh, have a really fixed budget and uh, have difficulties to, to well, cannot just cannot increase after that. So uh, if the country cannot increase the budget and it's still blocking, uh, then there are two options. Uh, one is to come back to the, to the projects who have submitted funding in that country and see if they can accept to work, so uh, have a negotiation with that uh, uh, project. This is what we had to do in the first call because it was so unbalanced and we were surprised to see that uh, uh, several of, well, all the projects we contacted that way, uh, well, they were very good and uh, people we contacted always had either a big I ERC grant or etc. and they accepted, they say, okay, um, I can reduce and I will take on my ERC grant and so that I can work uh, with partial funding and my other colleagues in the other countries uh, still go on. So of course we speak of the gray zone. If you are in the top of the ranking, you're safe. If you're way down the ranking, then there is no question. But there is this gray area which is always tricky for us to have more projects uh, given the, the, the funding, the available funding in the different countries. And um, so one option is to, uh, uh, to negotiate with the project. And we can also partially do budget transfer between countries because we get a significant amount of uh, support from the commission. So we can try to reshuffle that. But obviously, uh, if you start to move around funding from one country to another, um, that, that, that can be f perceived as unfair and that can lead to the funding organization to put less funding in the next call so that would uh, collapse, have the whole thing collapse and there would be no new call. So uh, this is a last resort uh, option. So this being said, uh, you had a question? Okay, good. All right. So then I'm uh, almost uh, to the end. Um, what are the main steps after you uh, submit your pre-proposal? Uh, what will happen then? Um, first, we will uh, have the panel uh, assess those pre-proposals. Uh, it's a two-step process, two-step evaluation. So um, we will have the panel assess evaluate the pre-proposals, uh, 
uh, in this first stage, the panel will just meet once without the intervention of external experts, propose the first ranking, and we will, on that ranking, we'll select the top first. Um, the idea is to take about three times our available budget. So if we have 15 million euros, we'll take 45 million euros worth of proposal in the ranking order. And then for those projects which are, uh, which are selected uh, in this first um, step, uh, we will invite them to publish, to, sorry, to submit uh, a full proposal uh, which will be in uh, July. So the we uh, anticipate that the result of the first step will be in May, and we will ask the full proposal uh, in early July. Or so you will know the date uh, by then. Um, and then there will be the second step. The full proposal will be evaluated again by the panel this time with the support of external experts. Uh, and we will publish the result uh, in October. And for selected projects, you will be requested to proceed with the formal association with the flagship. Uh, and uh, we will prepare the contracts so that the projects start at the end of the year. Uh, there is some flexibility. Uh, March would be really la the latest. Uh, would prefer uh, avoiding, of course, but ideally December or January or February. One last uh, thing to really clarify the whole picture. As I said, and I insist, I, ins I insist, um, the transnational call are only part of the picture. Uh, please consider that you can also join the flagship through national calls, existing calls. So here is a comparison of what goes on in the transnational call and what goes on in a national call. So in the transnational call, the topic definition is really done with the flagship core project, whereas in national calls, well, can get some inspiration maybe, but no, it's basically independent. In the transnational call, we uh, ask in the proposal what are the expected synergy, and it's compulsory to have the full information. Uh, in a normal call, of course, you can mention I plan to uh, work with the flagship and that will br bring me this and that, uh, but it's optional. Uh, here you need at least two, if not four countries, depending on whether uh, your configuration you consider. Uh, whereas here, obviously, it's one country. And uh, then you have uh, other obvious differences. Uh, here, only some country participate. Uh, here, any country uh, can work. Um, the budgets are smaller, but you compete only with people, with a smaller set of people. Here, you have more uh, budgets, but well, that's uh, business as usual. Um, so those are the main differences between the transnational call and the classical call. And uh, that finished my talk. You have further information here, the website, download the, co the full call announcement, read very carefully the co full call announcement. Uh, there are national annexes with contact points and detailed information about the eligibility in each country. Uh, some countries, for example, put a maximum amount of funding for the partners in that country. I in case of uh, need, you can uh, contact Fabien, who is there. Maybe you can raise your hand again, Fabien, so that everybody one identify you. So you can uh, email uh, Fabien, you can call uh, him. We, we have our uh, phone number in the documents. Uh, or uh, if the question is more geared toward the flagship, you can uh, contact them. And so thank you for your attention. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, all right, so. Yes, uh, sorry. When discussing the, so you were talking about the top ranked 
uh, applications um, for the short submission. Um, now, for the Human Brain Project, for example, there are specific topics that one applies to. There's one that's memory, let's say. So if I apply to memory, when you talk about top ranked, are you talking about top ranked overall, across all, all topics? Yeah. or so, so, so it isn't decided. We're definitely, we're definitely going to fund one project for this topic, one project for this topic. It's topic independent. You topic can independent. see that as a big topic. One big topic, which is the union of those 14 or 10 or 11, depending on the case, uh, topics. So okay. it, by the way, we paid attention to the, we pay attention to vocabulary. Uh, in this call, we call a topic graphene or HBP. Each topic has one or two subcalls, <coughs> and each of those subcalls have, are have areas. Areas. Uh, okay. Areas are there only for statistical purposes, and I mean when we will analyze the results, etc., or allocate the reviewers to the proposals. It's guidelines. But there is nothing about the ranking, et cetera, which is interacting with those. So it might happen, an extreme would be that all the projects are all from a single area. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the first HPP call, um, it, there was a strong bias. But certainly, the evaluators will be selected based on the area that you uh, apply to. Yeah, we try to have evaluators in all areas well, they, we, we make sure that all areas are covered. And of obviously, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. We don't say you are in this area. We just make sure that every area is covered. And then we optimize the, the distribution, the, uh, the assignment. Um, this goal does or does not have uh, co-funding by the European Commission. What is the amount? What is the uh, maybe one third? One third. So I mean, so what do you call addition? What I, that's, that's, that, that's always if I look at your table, I see, for instance, for Spain, uh, the f the funding available by Mineco is about uh, well, it's exactly uh, five hundred and sixty million euros. So that means that. Um, if a Spanish partner asks for money, the total will be this or will be this plus one third by the European Commission. I mean, uh, shared among uh, partners, of course. So, uh, the commitment to fund project is up to this. And what each country wants to do with the reimbursement is their their own decision. Just like when you have a, a European project, you get reimbursed. And uh, we don't ask you to put that money in addition to your own money. You get reimbursed, basically. Uh, so that's the same with us. We are reimbursed. And uh, we, we do uh, what we want with that funding. Even though the commission argues that it should be in, ad in, in, in the end, that's true. It's in addition that is, this already takes into account that effect. This is the total amount we commit to fund to projects. And it might increase or it might decrease if we don't get enough requested funding in a given country. I'm not sure I understand that. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Going to the to the total. So let's look, for instance, at the total of the graphene. It's nine thousand seven hundred thirty-five uh, kilo euros. Uh, that is the total total maximum amount available for the project, or the the the, the amount is this plus one third by the commission. That is no, the point. This is, this is the indicative amount. In the end, it can be more. It can be less. So, 
so basically this means so this means well it depends on the countries this figure means that 1 million 120 <laughs> kilo euros has been earmarked somewhere in that ministry which happened to be the one of most interest here but uh, they have earmarked that and the promise to the other countries and to the community is that if they have requested funding up to that they will stand to the they will meet their commitment and if it goes further there is no commitment but at the same time we are willing to to work together and so sometimes it's our turn because there is much demand in a given country we augment our budget but it's on a voluntary basis and actually some countries are already said no way that's our right and some other countries rather say uh, anything I get a stop up I'm quite willing to increase my amount with that. Yes. Yes, it's it's already in. Yeah. So the the the, as, the answer is yes. It's already in. Yeah. So if we didn't have, so another way to put it is that, so another way, another way to put it is that if we didn't have co-found, the call would be would have been smaller. Um, uh, my question is: uh, Is there any limitation in the number of um, institutions that participate per country? Ah, good question. Uh, no. But you have the balance rule in terms of budget, uh, the 60% or 75% rule. Have you noticed that? The I right. can. So you have to balance, not here, based on... on here, uh, you first have the balance rule. That is, if you put four institutions in one country and only one in the two other countries, and the budget is balanced per partner, then you don't have that rule. So maybe it can happen that uh, you have one major partner and for some reason, I don't know, hospitals who would all ask a smaller budget. You can have many partners if they are okay with this, if the balance is respected. And also, if it's too unbalanced, you might have an issue with just the balance in the project that is... Um, it's considered as artificial, it's kind of national project with some artificial extension, but there is no, the only eligibility rule is this. Okay. And, and also, um, there is no maximum number of partners, nor maximum number of countries, but obviously, I mean, don't, don't grow to sure, sure. To much. The second question is, is there any criteria um, favoring those uh, proposals that include uh, core members of the flagship projects? Mm, no. No. Uh, everyone is equally eligible. Okay. There was in the first call some incitation in the other direction. This is gone. So now it's perfectly equally eligible. Thank you. Yes. About rules. Uh, um, uh, last uh, uh, <coughs> call, uh, you said that um, uh, only about uh, twenty uh, percent were accepted of proposals, and um, uh, could you name the main rules? Uh, uh, why uh, some projects were accepted and uh, others were refused. Because we now will return and discuss in our groups, apply or not to this um, uh, project. Which, uh, where, 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 what 
reasons were to, uh, to accept or to refuse. What were the reasons to accept or to refuse? Yes, projects uh, su submitted. So uh, maybe I should remind that uh, the, the, the selection is fully based on the ranking of the scientific evaluation panel. And the criteria, you're right, I didn't mention that again, but the criteria, you will find that in the call announcement, it was already in the pre-announcement, are very classical criteria excellence, implementation, impact. And in the first step, we add um, adequacy to the call, or uh, I don't remember, I guess it's adequacy, or the fact that you are in the topic. If you are out of the topic, you get out in the first phase, and then it's the, it's, well, very classical. So then the main reason is uh, the project is not considered good enough by the panel. Plus, of course, the LGBT rules. We have a very few, but a few projects which are considered ineligible because they don't follow, stick to the rules. That can be a, a, a risk. Yes? Hello, I have two questions. The first one is uh, about the if different groups of different laboratories from the same institution make part of, the, of a single partner. For example, I, I, I collaborate with another group from another department, but in the same university. We are considered at, uh, as one single partner in the proposal or, or not? Okay, well, uh, contractually, in the end, definitely yes. So we recommend that in the proposal, you also present that as a single partner, but you clearly show that within this partner, you have two teams. And the second question is uh, concerning that uh, there are two calls in the graphene. One is related to ba basic research, and Italy is not participating in this uh, sub-call. Yes. So if I need a, a group uh, from Italy to work in, in the project because it's very important. Uh, what can I do? Can, can I put this group but uh, without asking for funding? Or yes, uh, you're right. I didn't mention that. It's clear in the call announcement. You can involve groups anywhere in the world. Well, I didn't mention. Actually, I mentioned that this was the reason for mentioning it here at the bottom. This is what did happen in the first call, we did have projects, and it's uh, also, of course, offered this time. If you really need a partner which is available, uh, able to come with its own funding and securing its own funding, it's possible. And that goes beyond the, 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 the rule we, which we were discussing. Uh, uh, beyond this option, I, I mean, if it's not a flagship partner, which is securing its own funding, then you have to still have three partners uh, requesting funding, or two plus one in the core project, plus the one who is not in the core project and securing its own funding. Thank you. All right. So uh, we are running out of uh, time, and we do have a session in the end for additional questions. So unless there is a burning question, uh, we will move on um, because so we had ample time uh, and there will still be time for networking, but it's good that we proceed. So I would like to invite Cecilia uh, Cabello now. Uh, <laughs> nice seeing you. Um, to uh, make a presentation. Uh, which is about a new component in the flagship program. Uh, since Jean-Marie Auger, our project uh, officer, was not there, you might not have been have got the big picture. But the Fed flagship unit at the Commission found, uh, of course, the two core projects, then the Eranet Flagera, and uh, some CSAs. One uh, first, which is more for the internal, let's say, uh, evaluation and monitoring of the long-term progress. 
and creating indicators and etc. So you're not directly involved or interested. Plus a second one now, which is called Scope, which is for providing more direct support to the partnering project. And Cecilia is the coordinator of that CSA. Thank you, Edward. Um, I'll be really short since I know that you all had a very long morning and you've heard many uh, presentations, but uh, the reason why I'm here, as uh, Edward said, is just to uh, um, tell you a little bit about the SCOPE project, which is a sport and coordination project for the partnering environment. So it's a project that starts now, January 1st. Actually, tomorrow is our kickoff meeting, so I'm presenting a little bit before the kickoff meeting. Um, and the idea is basically that, is to promote partnership environment with, uh, with the flagships and providing a flex flexible and efficient me mechanisms to form them. So the, the, the key is, is those of you that end up being funded in within the, um, the joint uh, transnational call is, is part of the, the, the passageway to get into the, into the partnership uh, environment. So um, basically the reasoning for the commission was that they thought uh, the, flag uh, the FET flagships, as you well, I think you're sure aware of it, have their core projects and their core projects have many, many work packages and development and part of their work is also to uh, enrich the whole science and technology um, arena, science and technology community. Um, in, the, in those areas, but also the national funding agencies should be supporting the, um, these developments and the regional governments also. So the whole idea is, is to bring together many um, researchers in, in an environment that are directly linked not only to the core project, but through the partnership projects. So, as you all know, I won't go into the philosophy behind the FET flagships, but the idea is to build uh, it's, it's a new innovative con concept that the commission has, um, has designed and um, what we are to, to do in our project is, is a, a modest uh, uh, part, but it has to do with that networking and dissemination and interrelation between the two. So the SCOPE consortium is just three partners. And basically, we, what we try to do is bring together different perspectives um, and to achieve the goals that the SCOPE project wants to, wants to uh, accomplish. It positions itself as a facilitator between the core projects and the partnership projects. And basically, right now, it is the, the fact that it's starting in 2017 is very positive because we're coming into a process now where the, the community of the partnership projects is, is getting enriched and is, and is growing. So that's, that's where we are. ESF and EPFL at um, FACIT, F the Spanish Association, are the, the three partners. Many of you know ESF has the uh, background and all the knowledge uh, with the Graphene flagship um, project. The uh, EPFL has uh, the relation and the direct relation with the, with the human brain. And FACIT is an outsider. It's a newcomer in this whole arena, so I have to admit that I'm, I'm new in this. I, I'm not really familiar with the whole uh, environment and the communities that are involved with the FET flagship, but what we wanted to offer is that neutral role and our expertise as a foundation in um, science dissemination and communication and actually help be that facilitator. So we have two very strong um, partners that are directly involved with the, with the uh, FET flagships and that's, that's our force there that we have those two partners there and FACIT is kind of like a facilitator in the part of communication. So um, basically, as I've already said, we want to pr um, promote the partnership environment. So what we're going to do, how are we going to do this in the project for the next uh, three years? Our general objectives is to directly support the partnership projects to engage in collaborations with the core projects. And so there, our focus is networking and dissemination between the two, um, the two uh, groups. Um, enhancing synergies between the flagships and also the national, regional, and local programs. Let's see, basically why not? we want the Commission and Europe wants these flagships to grow and to be strong, so we need to help the, um, find where those synergies uh, uh, can, be, can be reached. And to support the development of flagships in general so that it can, re it can really reach the goals that it's trying to pursue, the economic and social and innovation benefits that, um, that Europe wants. So how are we going to do this? We're going to provide direct support to the institutions and the researchers involved in the partnership projects. We're going to liaison between the core projects and the flagships, and we also have a very, very strong relation with the uh, um, with the Flagetta project and the consortium in the Flagetta project because also they have a role, obviously, with the partnership projects. 
Uh, we want to access, um, assess the, uh, the different things that are occurring within the, the, um, the partnership projects, what their needs are, what their demands, and how we can, um, we can help them and, and promote them better um, more. And basically also we're going to raise awareness. We, we also want the, um, the society to know what is going on and what is happening and what the flagships are producing. All this is in collaboration with other actors that are doing the same. We're not alone. We're not trying to duplicate work. We're doing something, we're, we're doing a little added value there, giving a little emphasis and a little push to what, what is needed. So the, um, the, the uh, project is very simple. It has four work packages. And as you see, we have a, uh, work package two, focus for the human brain project, work package three, focus for graphene, and work package four, which is communication dissemination. Here, this is the role where I said facet and our institution, if some of you know us, we, are, um, we have a strong communications role. So specifically, if we get down to the detail, a little bit more detail, not too much, because I don't want to bore you and overwhelm you with the, with, the, with the project, because it's just starting and there's a lot of things to be defined. We want to, in HPP partnership projects, the idea is to provide support for them and to efficiently organize the interactions between the uh, core project and the HPP flagship and the dialogue with the partnership projects. We ad I want to identify potential needs for additional PPs and promotion for their partner partnership and their opportunities. We, we want to assess the status in terms of the research areas and see what can be done. And we want to monitor and assess, obviously, the activities and what benefits can be given to the, to the flagship. The graphene has a little different, um, similar, but a little different objectives because obviously the maturity and, the, and the, the, the focus of each of the flagships has its own unique uh, status, so that's why it's not a, a photocopy between both flagships, they're, they're different. So again here, providing support to the pro uh, partnership projects, identifying potential needs, assessing the status, monitoring the access to the added value of the partnership projects, and to providing, provide support and guidance in the process of definition and the management structure. So here there's a, a definitely a, a more tailored role that has to um, be involved with the FET, uh, flagship and, gra and graphene. In general, what are we going to do? This is common to all. We want to um, provide mutual ben uh, benefits between the projects and the core projects. Again, the whole idea of the complexity of the FET flagships, which I'm sure probably all of you know better than I do, but there's a, it's a very complex organization and structure, governance, networking, and how, how it's working. So we want to we make sure the partnership projects feel a part of it also. We want to maximize the opportunities and m make sure that the partnership projects and the FET, pl FET flagships and the whole achieve their results. And a um, lot of this will be done in the end, to be simple, is to support direct, the direct active involvement, through example, covering travel fees, for example, to, to be able to be there, because you know if you're not there, it's harder to, 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 to achieve that network, uh, networking. And that uh, is what we're going to do. So I mean, it's, it's, it's simple, but it's complex. I guess that's what I'm trying to say is helping the part partnership project in, through the direct support, but how we're going to do it is what we need to work on and, and develop in line with the FET flagships and their interests. So for communication, we're going to develop a communication strategy. And again, we're going to be very in line with the, with the core projects. We are not going to develop our own web page of the project because we thought that would be much better is to already take advantage of what Graphene has in their, in their web page, what HPP has in its web page, and of course, if Flagera um, has a very interesting web page, if we have information that would be interest to the partnership projects, also use their channels of information. So we don't have to have n, n, n different web pages for each different project, but in, actually uh, use the channels that are already exist in, in for communication to reach you, to reach the scientific community. So we want to target all stakers, stakeholders, not just the research community, but also the public authorities and also the general pub, um, population. And when the society knows and is aware, then they can defend it and they can understand it. And, and, and as we all know, society needs to better understand how the investment in, in, and the money that is being um, invested in science and technology produces results, produces economic and social uh, benefits. Like I said before, FACIT has um, a strong communications um, and dissemination background. Um, on one side, we finance um, communication dissemination and research projects within Spain, but we have developed also a new agency that um, disseminates uh, um, scientific information to the to the to the press. And it's like a like your Europa Press. It's like EP, it's like a, a news agency, independent news agency. And that's it. <laughs> so um, if you have any questions, <laughs> I'm open to you. Okay, Edward. 
Any questions? Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. So your CS, this is a question about your CSA uh, provenance. It comes from a FET initiative or something yes, like yes, this? Yes. Okay, so will you also take a look at the FED projects, whether they could be uh, suggested for partnering for uh, the flagships, for instance? I mean, are you going to uh, overview what's happening? Okay, the, the, um, yeah, we're gonna overview what's happening. Generally, um, there is already, the, the, the core projects already have a definition of how, what their understanding of a partnership project label is, and that's something that we have to work on with them. So I can't answer you yes, no directly, but definitely we're gonna look at the whole universe of research projects that are going on. Um, my partners are here. I don't know if they have any additional comments, but yes, we should be looking at the whole universe of research projects to be able to include them in the partnership projects. But remember, the flagships themselves have their uh, definition of what is included or not. And did I understand it wrong when you said that you might become a sort of hub for a communication uh, facilities for the flagships and no, no, partnering no. projects? The, 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 each flagship has its own communication. Uh -huh. um, facilities and it's and it's uh, their own communication departments what we're focusing on is the communication of the partnership projects because the 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 the, the communication of the FET um, of the flagships themselves focus on what the flagship is doing and outside of that circle outside of that universe is the partnership projects so who's talking about them and that's what we want to do we want to talk about them but instead of putting on a different web why don't we join it where it should be Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much, but I'll be around if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, maybe the, there is one word of vocabulary here. Uh, the word flagship sometimes is ambiguous because sometimes flagships mean f the core project alone and sometimes it means the core project and the partnering project. Uh, from the position of the flag, Fed flagship program and the commission and I think from the member state also we try to make it clear that the flagship initiate flagship stands for stands short for flagship initiative which is the whole thing and the core project yeah the idea is to well that the, the the whole idea behind that is that we try to do the European research area that is try to cooperate and, and go in the same direction. So the initiative should aggregate all efforts in that direction, including those funded through partnering projects. So uh, typically scope uh, and Flagera also uh, somehow, but Flagera would cover a partnering project funded by national funding organization member of Flagera and would not cover partnering projects funded by private organizations, self-funded companies, or, or even maybe uh, some national funding organization which is not part of Flagera for some reason. There are not so many, but so this is more an exception than a rule, but the private version is definitely out of the scope of Flagera as is in the scope of scope. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, I uh, just, um, uh, we had, no, that's scope, sorry. Um, it happened that we have one uh, partnering project. Where is it? Um, no, this is not the, the one. I hope I have copied it. Uh, where is? Okay, here it is. Um, and how to Ula? What's happening here? Uh, would it be this? Well, okay. Anyway, there are only two slides. So, uh, one coordinator of a partnering project which is one of the projects selected in the first call of Flagera. Uh, in this case, it's for HBP. I uh, couldn't join today for, for, it was not unexpected. It was, he, he just uh, didn't, uh, was not available. Uh, however, um, he wanted to uh, show uh, what 
was the benefits of being a partnering project from his point of view. So uh, there are only two slides. One is about the project, so the project is called Fine, like Ferret Interactive Integrated Neurodevelopment Atlas. So the ferret is uh, an animal which has some specific uh, things about the development of the brain in that animal. Um, and the consortium is, uh, so the coordinator is uh, Institut Pasteur in France, and so the coordinator is Roberto Toro, who has prepared the, the, those two slides. And the partnership is with uh, partners in the Netherlands, another one in France, and uh, one in Canada. That's one example of a partner securing its own funding. Uh, so, um, then, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, that's the, the slide where uh, he uh, summarized its interest. So, the figure here uh, shows the various sub-projects of HBP, uh, which are more or less connected, and this is the connection within the core project, and the black circles show the sub-project where they interact. So the idea is to show that uh, they can interact with more than one sub-project, or with more than one work package in Graphene. And so the message is that they, uh, the partnering project and the integration in the flagship uh, allowed them to reach a larger community, start new collaboration, integrate their scientific and methodological development within a larger framework, and make their research more reasonable and interoperable. And um, this is not the first time they are expressed that they are very happy of being uh, associated to the flagship. So uh, I thought it was interesting to have this um, uh, feedback uh, from one uh, partner, even if he could not manage to do it himself. So, uh, this with this uh, nice uh, conclusion, I would like to close uh, this morning session, plenary session. We are late on schedule, but we have still ample time for networking. Um, so, lunch is ready, actually. Uh, I, is it correct? Or it will be ready in a, in a five minutes maximum, if I understood correctly. Uh, so anyway, there is the poster session and the lunch. Everything is there. Is that correct? Uh, so very simple. So maybe you want to add something. Uh, and we will resume. Uh, uh, no, just one small point. There were some vegetarians. So there is some salad and an other thing for vegetarians. So the rest is. Uh, if you're not a vegetarian, don't eat that <laughs> portion. <laughs> All right. So uh, that closed the morning session. The floor is open to uh, poster and lunch. Uh, and we will resume here at a quarter past three for the final question and answering session and closure. Have a good lunch. Well deserved. <laughs> Thank you for your patience.